I'd like to uh, call this regular council meeting on July 27th, 2021 to order with the adoption of the agenda. Someone want to make that motion for me, please. Councilor Shillette, seconded by Councilor Palmer. All in favor? Motions carried. Adoption of the minutes of the July 13th, 2021 meeting. Councilor Palmer, Councilor Shillette, all in favor? Motions carried. Any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none, I'm going to move on to uh, announcements from the mayor. So just a couple things that are happening this week, just in emergency planning. So uh, here locally, we've elevated our EOC to level one, gathering uh, people together so they're ready to go at any time. But also uh, under contract with the CSRD, the Revelstoke and Area Emergency Management Plan has uh, contracted uh, with the alert app. So if you have that alert app, and you're, uh, you've got it this past week, you've heard the bells go off. Uh, definitely it's loud and we know it's there, we know it's working and it's, uh, it's definitely there to uh, warn us if there's any, uh, any impending danger as we move forward, just so that the community's aware of that. So I'm gonna move on now to item eight, uh, the step Forum Permanent Liquor License, uh, recommendations from the Committee of the Whole. Um, we have a staff member that wants to uh, talk about that with a presentation. We're just going to. It's always a delay. Uh, you worship on the floor, it's not it's on vacation. So. Okay. All right. So um, let's uh, let's move this uh, forward. So I'm going to put this motion on the table. We did discuss it at the committee of the whole. Councilor Sherlock. That the request from Revelstoke Grizzlies Hockey Society for the City of Revelstoke to pursue a permanent liquor license for the Revelstoke Forum pending resolution of building and fire code issues be referred to Council and the Finance Committee for budgetary considerations. Second for the motion, please, Councilor Elliott. Any discussion on the motion? I have a question, Councilor Brooks. I, I'm just so it's being referred to Council. Is that now? Yeah, it is now. No. No. Okay. They're referred to Council. The plan actually. But it's just the finance committee for the budget. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you're so okay with that? Some background. background. They, they currently apply for a liquor license every event, every week. Yeah. 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 So the city will be the holder of the liquor license, permanent liquor license for the building. And they will be the third party contractor on that. Okay, I'll ask the question. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Moving on to item 9A bylaws, uh, development services. So I'm going to put that on the table and then we'll uh, ask Ms. Wade if she has any comment. Councillor uh, Councilor Palmer. The building bylaw number 2294 begin to talk. Second for the motion, Councillor Sherlett. Discussion on the motion. Any comments? Uh, Ms. Wade, do you have any comments on, on the building bylaw? No, I don't, Your Worship. I'm open to any questions that uh, Council may have. Council, any questions, Councillor Sherlett? Uh, not so much a question, it's just a comment that I really appreciated how engaged uh, the building community was in this process to get our building bylaw up to snuff and more in line with provincial guidelines so that we're not a one-off. Uh, this is an important part of getting our housekeeping in order with all of our rules. So I'm really glad to see this come to fruition. Great. Any other comments from council? Seeing none, I'll ask the question. All those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Moving on to item 9A, pardon me, 9B, Development Services Zoning Bylaw 2290. So I'll put that on the motion. Councilor Ryan. That's zoning amendment bylaw number 2290 be adopted. Second for the motion, please. Councilor Sherlett. Discussion on the motion. That's dealing with uh, that clinic in the uh, Victoria Road area. So any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor. Motion's carried, thank you. Moving on to item 9C, zoning amendment bylaw short term rentals. Uh, want a presentation on this, Ms. Floyd or Mr. Simon? Yes, Your Worship, I just have a short presentation on this. So I will ask uh, for my 
I, I be able to share my screen? Bear with me as I work out this, my re, re, relearning Zoom. <laughs> there, can you all see my screen now? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, so before you today, we have, after a year and a half of consultation work, uh, coming back and forth with Committee of the Whole and Council, um, after the June 8th, uh, staff has prepared the amending bylaws to address the short-term rental. Uh, so what we have before you today is I'm just quickly going to recap. So we'll have our staff recommendation. I'll talk briefly about the June 8th council resolutions, the proposed amendments and next steps. So staff is recommending that uh, bylaw number 2295 be read a first and second time and that a public hearing for bylaw number 2295 be scheduled in accordance with the section 465 of the local government act. Uh, at our la at the June 8th, 2021 council meeting, the resolution was that uh, policy for short-term rentals, the uh, cap for short-term rentals at 300 units citywide, um, including excluding existing CD zones, uh, which includes RMR lands be prepared and that short-term rentals be restricted to secondary suites in uh, residential areas within the city and that staff prepare the amending bylaws. Those amending bylaws are attached to your report um, that is with you for today. Uh, just high level, uh, just to refresh that we had the guiding principles endorsed by council that uh, guided us through this process uh, to achieve these um, principles. The proposed amendments as outlined in your report and that were discussed at the June 8th and prior uh, Committee of the Whole meetings um, are outlined in your report and have been amended in the zoning bylaw that's attached to your uh, report. Next steps in the approval process. Today we are at uh, July 27th and councils got before them the consideration of first and second reading of the zoning bylaw amendments and the, to set a public hearing. Once the public hearing is held, um, we anticipate that in September, unless otherwise directed by council, uh, then uh, we would have more public input um, about these bylaws. And after third reading, then staff would bring forward the amending procedural bylaws for the business license um, bylaw, which will include a schedule attached to the business licensing with the policy for the cap. Uh, we staff has drafted that um, and it is ready for uh, when we bring this forward. And they would also bring forward the uh, fees and charges bylaw. And also we would bring forward the MTI bylaw and all the amendments that are required. These amendments uh, would be brought forward after council considers um, third reading of the zoning bylaw amendments. And then we bring forward these three um, bylaws for amendments for first, second and third reading. And then we would bring all four of the amending bylaws back at once. This just allows for a very synchronized and coordinated process because the first piece that we need to address is the zoning bylaw to set the enforcement regulations. Uh, just 
to quickly touching on enforcement, um, as I indicated that after the third reading of the zoning bylaw amendments, then we would bring forward the required procedural bylaws and we are working internally on that with our bylaw enforcement and corporate and director of finance um, on all these three bylaws. And then these would become forward for council's consideration after third reading of the zoning bylaw amendments. So staff is recommending that, um, that there's Council consider the first and second readings of bylaw number 2295 and set a public hearing. And I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have. Any questions for Ms. Wade, council? Councilor Charlotte and Councilor Elliott? Forgive me, this might feel really obvious afterwards, but the MTI bylaw, which one are you referring to there? Ticket, it's municipal ticket information. Ah, perfect, thank you. I knew it makes sense as soon as I heard it. Councilor Elliott? Just uh, if we get to the second reading, which we were asked to pass, when, this, when we get to the public forum, the changes or recommendations that come from that forum, how easy is it to implement? Ms. Wade, would you weigh in for Councillor Elliott, please? Yes, sir. Your Worship, through to Councillor Elliott. Um, any recommendations that Council wanted to make um, would be um, a result of the public hearing. And those amendments would be brought forward as long as they're not of significant subnatural changes, um, they would be addressed. And I don't know if Mr. Matuzzi wants to weigh in on that as well. Generally speaking, the items are on the table and these are you know, tweaking and the public said, could you add this? As long as they were part of the information, uh, the council could make those. If it's something right out of the field that nobody had ever discussed before, then you know, it would be prudent to take those changes back to uh, a public hearing because everyone wants to have time to see them. So generally speaking, after a public hearing, you can make changes as long as they were something completely out of the blue that no one else had ever seen. So the public consultation that's been engaged in to this point has had a lot of feedback. We've right. had a lot of input. We get, I mean, now the, the, the official document is, is here before us. What changes do you perceive? What are, this is this is a starting point. You can't adjust it. You must get to the final decision. The next go around. And right at, at third reading. Is that the final third reading is the final. And then we adopt it after that. Okay. Separate meeting after that. Councilor Palmer. Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor Souls. Um, I'll put a motion that bylaw number 2295 be read a first time. I'll speak to that uh, after. Uh, Is there a second for that motion? And just if I may, uh, after that, if this goes through and it's read a first time, there will be an opportunity for council to uh, ask for um, the second uh, second reading as well. So it's not prohibited. Okay. Are, are, you, are you just looking for the opportunity to discuss why that why you want to do that? Yeah. Okay, so it's seconded by Council Charlotte. Um, Council Palmer, I'll ask you to explain what you were thinking. Yeah, so uh, just further to the dialogue that Council's had on, especially Councillor Elliott, on okay, what if there's substantive changes? And the, the, the two things that uh, I've received a fair bit of feedback are on the two new things that we introduced at the last meeting, specifically on the, the 300 cap, uh, and also on the restriction to uh, uh, lower suites. Uh, a fair bit of concern uh, from accommodation people, individuals, uh, and then also on housing needs. And so to me, those may be considered substantive. And uh, so I would like to have a little bit more you know, more dialogue by having first reading. Uh, if we if we pass this first reading, uh, I'm just wondering about proposing that we send out, uh, uh, you know, to get more feedback so we can make those changes instead of waiting until after the public hearing to have it clarified. That's kind of what I'm thinking about. Uh, the As it stands right now, uh, based on the feedback that I've received since last meeting, I could not support uh, the going going ahead. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at. I, I I think there needs to be. It's such an important thing for this community, and I know council has been uh, working on the uh, getting the short term rental thing done uh, for a long time, and, uh, and we're anxious to have it done. But 
I, I'm just, I'm, I'm receiving more reservations about it than enthusiasm for going ahead. Going ahead. So that's that's kind of where. Yeah. Okay. Going okay. Can I ask what reservation is it? Is it to do with the secondary suite aspect, or what what particular area? Yeah. So from the. Uh, uh, the accommodations, well, it's actually been various people. So on the restriction to the uh, uh, the restriction to the secondary suite, and I think Councillor Allen, you actually expressed some concerns about that, just fairness and stuff. So that that was a key focuser. I did support uh, Councillor Wright's uh, of that amendment on that. Um, but the feedback that I'm receiving is, are we taking even more accommodation? Away, affordable accommodation away from our, our community. So that's one of the concerns uh, by requiring the owner to be upstairs and only the secondary. The other is on the quality of the visit, visitation uh, experience. So those people that are coming into our community is going into a basement suite, really. What you expect when you come to a resort community. I know for me personally, that's not what I would expect. I'm expecting that. Or chalet type of experience. So that's that's the secondary thing. There is an outstanding, uh, another a third outstanding item on uh, the, the vacation rental. So in the Thomas Brook area specifically, but also other areas that are already operating as vacation rentals, legal non-compliant as I understand it, uh, that this may create confusion as to the the, those that are very close to the resort that just makes sense to have vacation rentals that are what you would expect in a community. And I don't believe that that has been adequately addressed to date and uh, possibly there could be some more dialogue. So these are some of the reservations. There's some of the other ones that we had talked about before and we're kind of getting past those and sort of seeking the rest of council, but those are the specific ones. And then on the 300 cap, so that was new last council meeting. Council, as a policy item, said, yeah, we can agree to that. There was questions about the legality, and I still have questions about that legality because we're saying the message that we received on other zoning items is that there's an entitlement, and now suddenly we're going to take that entitlement away by a policy. And, um, and I don't know that we've had a robust enough question or discussion or understanding. And when I thought about it more, it's sort of going back to this time when we were doing the spot zoning. Now this isn't spot zoning, but it's essentially doing this race, who's gonna get the first people to get their, their uh, those 300 permits for that. And the, the only difference from the spot zoning that the previous council did is that it's gonna be the first to get there. It's not going to be any kind of community output. I mean, so there, there's a, there's a fairness issue there, and I, I'm, I'm, if we go down this path, we're basically getting giving entitlement to all single residential homes within the entire community, and then by policy, we're trying to take it away from them. And so there, there's confusion in my mind on those two items. That's uh, so those are. And so by going, uh, by passing first reading, you know, if we do first reading, it's still all, all that stuff is still in there. Um, but then I would like to see, um, before going to second reading, ideally, uh, uh, looking at some other feedback mechanism. Now, one of the things that I do note, or did note in the planner's uh, presentation is on the timelines. So it's not like we're going to a public hearing in all in August, but right away, because often that's common, but at the earliest is what's being suggested is September. So I still think we can meet that, but have a little bit of time to, you know, get better feedback from stakeholders on those specific items. How we go about doing that, I think it'd be a separate question, but that's kind of where I'm at. But at this point, I do support the first reading, but I anticipate there's going to need to be some adjustments. It may be more substantive than waiting for the public hearing. So I have a question regarding your timeline and how we get the public to weigh in at this point. 
So we've done incredible background on this already. So you're receiving your emails or phone calls similar to the rest of us around the table. And so how do we address this in a way of moving this forward, still addressing it um, and dealing with it in a timely fashion? So do you have a suggestion as how do we have a public meeting? Do we, um, do we sit down and say, okay, these are the issues that have been brought forward to us by community members and we, and we actually hash that out and then uh, feel comfortable enough possibly to go to a second reading and then public hearing. What is your thought process? I know that these issues are here. Uh, my thought was we get to the public hearing, we talk about these things, we bring them forward, we go to the staff and say, okay, this is what we're hearing. We're already hearing this. So what are you thinking now so that we actually uh, move this forward, Council Palmer, and yet actually deal with the issues of the concerns of the community thus far. Right. So basically I'm dividing these two these two specific new items that have come come forward uh, because they haven't had the same kind of robust discussion in, in dialogue with individuals in the community is oh that are, we're very supportive of this bylaw that this is a mistake. And so this is new and that's and that's where there hasn't been robust uh, feedback from the public on specifically the the, the uh, policy cap and also on the uh, exclusivity to the basement suites. Um, so that mechanism, I, I think, would be a dialogue. I mean, you know, if this, I think we can get past this first reading. I probably would put something on the on the table, something that. Uh, staff provide some options is one way of doing it where we could just say that that further advertising uh, uh, asking for more feedback through social media and through the traditional and with the bang of the table kind of mechanism and then it could be brought back next meeting this could be brought back next meeting for second reading and say is there any adjustments is there any real information well, one thing that i'll just add is th those new items were in, were in the summer months and this is a very, very big thing for our community. We want to get it as right as possible, it won't be perfect. But in here we're doing it, these changes in the summer months when people aren't necessarily paying the same kind of attention. Okay, Mr. Matusi, you want to read? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, you know, the only concern, Your Worship, I would have was uh, a less formal process at this point in time. There has been public and all of these are uh, independent. You know, I, I, I would agree that uh, summer is not when you want to be totally, you know, public or, or having a public hearing or anything like that because people are, are going to be there. Uh, however, I also think it's it's a public hearing for all its faults is at least everyone knows that on this day, this is when the information comes in and all of council sees and hears all of the exact same information. So I think the formality of that would be helpful because then it's not uh, I got this email, but you didn't. And I think it's really important for council to see all the information shared. Yes, um, there are those two new proposals on the table, or different proposals. And yes, you may have to have another public hearing after, but but I, I'm thinking that it, it, it does accomplish the same thing uh, that Council Palmer's have after, but I, I would still move this forward to a public hearing. Have the public now see what's on the table, whether they like it or not. And council gets formal input, and everybody gets the same information. And then, if council decides they want to change, yes, it may cost you another public hearing at some point in the future. But at least there's a level playing field for the information that may. So my recommendation would be to proceed, have the public hearing, and yes, you may have to have another. But I would be concerned about an informal process where not all of council is seeing all the information. And it is summer. It would be hard to create something on the top. Okay, appreciate that input. Councilor Ryan and Councilor Schultz. Even though it's summer, I think people have been thinking about this for years. I mean, even at the staff level, it's been like six years since they've been starting to have this conversation more formally. So I don't know that time is going to be that useful. I think it's just a really hard problem. And I don't think anybody knows the right approach. And it's just that we're hearing before we have the formal uh, public hearing, we're just hearing from a few individuals that will also show up at that public hearing to express their thoughts. 
So I, I would agree that I think it makes more sense to just go to the public consultation and to make sure that that's well advertised and that everybody has a chance to be heard. Um, yeah. okay. Thank you, Councillor Schwab. I agree uh, with Councillor Ryan and Mr. Matusi. I think that August is one of our peak seasons for hospitality. So a lot of accommodator, accommodation providers right now are in their peak season. Um, so it's not so much that people are out on holidays, it's that they're working. Uh, and they don't have time to take away from that busy time to be able to be part of this. I do have reservations around limiting, limiting uh, the rentals to the secondary suites. I expressed those at the last meeting. Uh, I voted in favor of adding that to the bylaw with the intent that, uh, and Councilor Ryan had a very good point, it's hard to add restrictions later rather than take them, uh, loosening them off later. That's why I supported the idea of restricting it to secondary suites to start with. That was also my impression with the cap, is we need to start somewhere, and rather than allowing it everywhere in the city to make for an equitable playing field and then having it free to put a limit on it, we can increase that limit later should that be desirable for the community and long-term rentals be protected in some way. But at least it gives us a starting point to move forward as a community. I don't think that slowing down the process further and having more dialogue would be helpful in this instance because, like Councillor Ryan said, we've been hacking this out for six years. It's been a bone of contention because of that spot zoning. And I think that opening it up for 300 business licenses is lots of room for those existing zonings to get licensed and move forward with their business and their opportunity. Uh, but also to put some limitations in place so that we do protect those long-term rentals. I'm curious, Your Worship, if, if those particular, because those are the two particularly new changes to the bylaw, if those came through in public hearing that we wanted to adjust or change. So whether that was adjusting the cap, I would assume it would be a minor change and would not trigger another uh, second reading and then public hearing. But I'm wondering about that limitation to the secondary suites, is if we hear back from the community in the public hearing that this is a horrible idea for whatever reason, or that initial restriction is not as necessary or as beneficial as we had hoped, uh, then if we change that, would that trigger another, is that a substantive change or is that a minor change? Like that seems... Yeah, you worship it from my experience of it. It, it's it's been on the table, so whether it's there or not, it's not as though people didn't know about it. Uh, mm -hmm. what, I think a major change would be something completely different. Okay. That no one has ever heard of or discussed over the last six years. You know, okay. but I think that you know that's like an on off switch. You either do it or you don't. So when right. people would have their say, yeah. and the council could make the decision, but it's not as if the matter wasn't on the table. And with that answer, I'm very happy going to second reading and having a public hearing in the fall to discuss this as a community and make a decision so we can move forward. I think there's people operating outside of those boundaries and we need to get some rules in place for this winter so that we can have a functional community housing. Councilor Palmer, do you have a comment? Yeah, the question. Uh, so uh, the CAO was talking about, okay, well, we get to public hearing. Maybe if there's the backlash from the public that we may need a second uh, public hearing. And, and so just uh, how, how does that work? So say we have a first part, the first uh, go to second reading uh, and then realize, oh, oh, we made a mistake. How, what, what would that look to, like to get to a second? Uh, well, there's a couple of options. One of the ones that um, you know you can consider is if the meeting is you know uh, you can keep the meet the public meeting open and, and just you know reschedule to a future date. If it sounds like you know you're not getting enough input, uh, you, you know, and that would at least give you some ability to uh, uh, answer any questions that, that may have arisen. So it's not new information, but information that was discussed that you need clarity on. Um, if you go in a completely separate direction, then I would suggest that based on that, the report come forward, outline the new one, and then you may have to have another public hearing. Again, it really comes down to 
if it's new information is the way to think of it, not so much a, a reversal of information that's on the table, right? So uh, then just for clarity, basically there's two possible scenarios. If we go to second reading, one is to keep it open so then the hearing can continue to receive information. If it's closed, then we have to go get a couple little pickups. So the follow-up question to that is by going to a first reading, could we, with first reading, could we also have a public hearing in between first and second reading? I know it's a little unusual, but it's, and maybe there's not an immediate answer. I believe the answer is yes. But I, I believe the, the legislation is just can't go past this. You have to have a reading before the third. I'm not sure it matters necessarily if it's between the first or second. Right. I could be clear. Uh, if there's anybody that, that wants to clarify, but that's my impression. Uh, and Ms. Wayne, Mr. Simon, either one of you want to weigh in uh, regarding possible uh, scenario that Council Palmer could? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so, first of all, um, I believe we have to check with our development, um, our procedures bylaw um, as to how it's done, but under the LGA, um, you can have a public hearing before third reading, but you can't have it any later than third reading. So, um, and then we just have to check with our development procedures bylaw. Um, what, and I think historically how we have done it has been first and second reading and go to public hearing. And I can double check the development procedures bylaw on that. Um, and then regarding um, new information versus what's before us, for example, if uh, the cap wanted to be removed or altered, I, I believe that that is a motion that council can make after the public hearing at third reading and make that amendment. If it wants to remove the restricted use to just the, the secondary suite and make it for you know, the single family house, then you could do that at third reading as well. Those are, it's all information that has been discussed and we've received substantial um, feedback on that. Um, and the two motions were in response to what council was discussing at the table and asked us to go into and which we provided a solution for council. The policy has been uh, vetted by our legal counsel and is uh, perfectly legitimate to attach to our business licensing um, bylaw, which is where it's appropriate to be um, and allows us to implement. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to address them. So at this point in time, the motion on the table, first reading, um, my, my preference would be to go to first and second reading, and that's my preference, and then have the public hearing. And then we can, if we need to leave that public hearing meeting, adjourn it, not terminate it, adjourn it for clarification and come back to it to make those final adjustments if we haven't made those final adjustments during that public hearing and then uh, and then get everything lined up as far as the bylaw and then move forward. That's kind of what I'm thinking here. But now I'm going to ask for clarification, Mr. Matusi. We've got first reading on the table. Um, should we vote on this first reading and then uh, possibly put a second reading on or if we want to go to first and second reading, we vote this down and then go to first and second reading. Question for you. I think you do either. I, I, yeah, I think it's really just up to council. You go for first and then something could be second. Okay. That would just be the cleanest way to do it. All right. So, any further comments on the first motion on the table? Council Bertson. I, I just want to say I, I have some, I share some of Councillor Palmer's reservations about that. Uh, the limit and the secondary suites. I was really on the fence when the tune eighth meeting about the secondary suites. Um, but I, I'm more than happy to take that to the public hearing. And, you know, I, I can honestly say I'll be going in with an open mind because I'm not 100% sure on those. And I also share his reservations about some of that Thomas Brook area, some of that area that borders the resort lands, because realistically, that is really where vacation rentals should be if they're going to be anywhere outside of the resort land. So some of these limitations I don't think are good for the community. So Ms. Ms. Wade, I'm just going to, uh, I'll let Council Brooks Hill finish and then I'm going to get you to weigh in because you and I have had this conversation about Thomas Brook. So yeah, I'd be happy to hear what Ms. Wade uh, 
has to say about that. I don't know how easy it would be to specify a neighborhood, especially because Thomas Brook is still under the old CSRD zoning. That's a bit of a special case. Kind of, kind of a resort fringe area. Miss Wade, uh, would you like to weigh in, please? Thank you, Your Worship, um, and to Council. Councilor Michael Brooks Hill, um, yes, we're dealing with this at the OCP level where it's appropriate. It is currently still designated under the CSRD official community plan and zoning. Um, this has been on the books to be resolved. Uh, so as part of the OCP minor update that is coming before you shortly, the, it would be to make the Thomas Brook area a resort fringe area and allow for uh, uses that would be complementary to the resort, uh, but also still address some of the residential nature and would be able to allow for uh, a new zoning in regards to tourist accommodation where we'd be able to define those uses because uses there are not necessarily short-term rental as we're defining it here. They are larger with larger bedrooms and are more like a lodge pension very similar to a lot of the um, vacation accommodation that would be found at Kicking Horse Resort or would be found at uh, Fernie or Kimberly and their specific zoning that would capture that form of tourist accommodation, which we do not have in our zoning bylaw right now. And it's something that we were, are bringing forward as we do these housekeeping, getting um, minor updates so that we can actually reflect these issues that have been outstanding for several years. Great, thank you. Council Ryan. Does that include the Hay Road area, the Thomas Brook area? Mm -hmm. Or no? Mm -hmm. That's just closer to the resort. Yep. If there were like local, like in that area where there's already so many spots on vacation rentals, are there options for that neighborhood if they wanted to also be included in that? Or is that out of the question. I, I would need a little bit more clarity of what neighborhood um, you're referring to, Council Ryan. Are you talking about Aspen Crescent? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that kind of area, it's got a bunch of uh, spots on vacation rental homes. Yeah, it's Aspen Crescent. Okay, and so yeah. those those would not be in the, in the fringe resort fringe area, but is there any way that they could be if they, you know, if, if every single homeowner signed off on it and was like, yeah, we bought this house intending for it to be whatever. Is that an option? Through your worship to Council Ryan, those vacation rentals, I believe, are the ones that are already spot zone vacation rentals and are already captured in what we're doing today, which is the short term rental. So they would continue as is. A lot of them are four bedroom um, and they were permitted that in the spot zone. And so they would be captured um, in the 29 that we have that have been spot zoned that would be part of the, the cap that is currently proposed. Okay. Some clarification, Councilor Ryan. Yeah. It, is the spot zoning set up going to continue for a house that was, that if they want to get that zoning, is that option still available? No. Okay. No. So, so, stay spot zone. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering like what the options are. Like say you own a home, on Aspen Crescent and you're like surrounded by vacation rentals, is there anything that you can do beyond the rules that we put in place since you are so close to the resort and maybe those are your intentions? That's what I'm trying to get some clarity so, on. So presently it would be the application process that we're working on now. Mm -hmm. Those people would still have to go through that application and pay whatever the 300 bucks and apply and, and go forward uh, for that if the short-term rental thing is adopted. Right, uh, they wouldn't automatically be given the right because they have Mackenzie Village, which is uh, a CD zone, which is there, and the other ones are on the But you so, can, yeah, so okay. they can still apply, it just doesn't mean that they're going to automatically get it. Right, if you're within the 300 and you meet all the requirements, pardon, if you're within, if you meet right. the yes. requirements, yeah, apply, I you can apply, right? So, yeah, but that, that to me is the gist of. of, of my 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 yeah. Uh, Your command support of uh, vacation rental bylaw is that there's an inequity. We were creating zones where if you get in there first, you're okay. That's in a lot of communities, though. Yeah, right? and I'm saying, but then that was one community who said six hundred thousand. Now we're at eight hundred thousand dollars a home, and uh, so it's becoming very selective. And the only way you can afford it is renting it out. And 
renting it out year round is one option, but if I can rent it out three months and make the same money, I'd prefer that route. At least I have my own for <laughs> seven or eight months of the year that is my own. So I, I have a, a number of problems with the bylaw, but I'd like to get public input as soon as I could. Okay, Councilor Palmer, you have a comment or a question? Yeah, a comment to uh, Councilor Ryan. So I think what you're articulating there is a very, very good example of these unintended consequences from the bylaw. So they'll both continue with this. If, if this bylaw passes in that particular area, there's going to be this inequity. So one neighbor that got the spot zoning before has a big, uh, as you would expect, it going into a resort town. Uh, near the resort, not in the boonies, uh, of having a chalet kind of experience for your skiing or whatever, the neighbor will not be able to do that under the, the new, new one, even though they're both part of the 300, they're going to be confined if they, if. But that's why I'm wondering if we can extend that Thomas Brook area. And I think that's one of those questions that Thomas Brook, and I, to me, that's what you're talking about really, really makes sense. Yeah, you've got the and, ski resort, the golf course, the Mackenzie Village. And so, so the concern with the Thomas Brook, though, which is a little, is a little bit different, is there's what would appear to be the uh, legal non-conforming. But does this bylaw, and there's a question there, because there's other people that have vacation rentals, well run what you would expect in a resort town and so what happens with this bylaw now i think they're going to be legal non-conforming but are we inhibiting other good development uh, for that ski experience because one of the problems we have a problem with housing for workers that we might be taking away because we allow vacation rentals we have a shortage of uh post-COVID uh, accommodation to get tourists to come here in the first place. And so are we crippling that that part too? Have you seen the downtown? Okay. They're coming. Yeah. <laughs> They're here. They're here. I don't think that's yeah. the problem. Uh, but yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So where you know where are they going to, you know, where can they stay if they can't stay here? Yes, they go off to kicking horse. But so those are some of those problems. But you uh, Mayor Souls probably with the first reading uh, you know, probably I should call a question, I guess, on that, mm -hmm. that first reading on there. And um, yeah. Okay, any further comment on the motion on the table for first reading? Yes. What is the advantage of going to a single first reading as getting to the second? So, so through the mayor, uh, right now, it's, we go to a second reading right after this, there's no difference. I mean, there's still that option to go to second reading immediately after this. We can put a motion on the table for the second reading. So, so we pass this is a, take the bylaw that's before us yeah. and, and just do it just the first reading. That's what Tim is. Yeah, and so if he does that and if there's a motion around the table where you want to move another motion to go to second reading, then we can do that. And then we've accomplished what is in your package. And then we go to a public hearing motion. So, say so one or two things. You can defeat this motion and then you put the original motion on, or you can accept this motion. And if there's an appetite to go to the second motion, someone can put that on. Councilor Shola, do you have a comment? I just want to say a word of caution around defeating motions on readings. It makes me nervous having seen readings get defeated and then the whole thing scrapped in the past. And I would really no. hate to see that. If we're going to talk about putting the second reading on the table today, I would like to know there's enough support to get it through and not see that defeated. Because, in my, and I would happily be corrected, but from my understanding is if we do put second reading on the table and it does get defeated because we want to see more discussion, can that be brought back or does that defeat the bylaw after all of this work? Okay. So for me personally, I'm supportive of the first and second reading and then going to public hearing so we can hear from the community. So is there enough uh, on the table? Councillor Palmer. So uh, to the mayor, I think we all want this first reading. That's the step getting to the second reading. Yeah. I'm not necessarily supportive of the second reading, but let's get this first reading. I don't think we want to defeat the first reading. Yep. No, for sure. I just didn't want to jump on the bringing the second reading forward until I knew we had enough support. Okay. So let's vote on this reading now. 
Everybody in favor of the going to first reading? Motions carried unanimously. Does someone want to put the second motion? So, uh, Mayor Souls, if I may, I'd like to put a motion that the second reading be deferred until the next regular council meeting. And I can speak to that motion if there's a second here for that. Anyone want to second that motion? Sure. It's called order for at least for discussion. <laughs> at least for discussion. Yes. Yeah, All right. So, discuss. Yeah. Uh, so, the, the reason for that, there's a there's a number of questions there. We keep on questioning, and I think we need to be solid on getting to, for the same reasons that Councillor Charlotte was saying about, let's make sure that if we're gonna get the second reading, let's, let's move that ahead, if at all possible. This will give us a little bit of time to think through another two weeks, just to make sure all these little implications that we're trying to understand a little bit. And it is, in my opinion, is not holding up anything from what the planner uh, put on the schedule is, uh, that's being suggested that the public hearing is in September. If we get into uh, second reading by August, there's ample time to still get that public hearing. It's not slowing down from that perspective. So that's why I Any other comment, Councillor Schillett and Councillor Ryan? I think we've talked this out around this table about as much as we can. Without a proper public hearing with open dialogue and proper input from all avenues in their in that timing fall, not in the next few weeks. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be substantive conversation between now and then, and it's just gonna add another thing to our next agenda. Uh, I think we have enough on our plate. I would rather see this before. Okay, Councilor Ryan. Like, what is your plan for the next two weeks to figure it out? Like, to, or to get more information? So the, so I, uh, through the chair, so I'm really, it's giving this time to, to give it thought at, for individual counselors. Uh, we received the bylaw for the first time, uh, just on Thursday, I believe it was, the actual bylaw. And so for me to digest that, I've had the weekend that I didn't have ample time to really think it through. And, but I think more importantly, like we could go to the second reading now, or we can do it next meeting. It's the same amount of time. Maybe it's a little bit more, but maybe it's, maybe it's less because I'm going to have less questions. I probably will not support going to second reading this meeting um, for what it's worth. Any other comments around the table regarding the motion on the table to defer to the next meeting? It's not on the table. We didn't have a second. Okay, I'm going to second. So it's called question. Just a question. Communities are, are struggling with this vacation rental issue throughout the country uh, and throughout North America. Some have had proposals laid up in front of them and denied the application. I'm going to talk to the gentleman this afternoon or this morning regarding that. Thing. They, they went through a whole planning process and then they got to the table and it was voted against. Would we have that option? Once we have a public hearing, yeah. I mean, it gets so controversial or heated, or or something out of the blue comes to us that makes sense. Could we decide against? It? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. At the third hearing, yeah. So after, after the public hearing, after the public hearing. So you don't, you still don't know. Third reading, really, you can basically say at that point we're not supportive of this, and yeah, and that's that's what I'm on. We still have that option to. Choose off against it if, 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 if the opportunity is there. I'm all for it. And willing to say. Okay, so at the present, there is a motion on the table to defer this to next meeting with no input, uh, no required input from staff to deal with any of the issues that's already been brought forward. It just gives you as a council a chance to read through things again if you intend to, and then you can come back next week. And then we will uh, put the motion on the table to go to second reading. And then if that's passed, then go to public hearing. So my question to you, is there anyone that wants any more information on the motion? So that's on the table. Call question. Okay. All those that would like to defer the second hearing or the second uh, reading to next week, are you in favor? No, Councillor Palmer's in favor. Those opposed to deferring that. Note that the balance of council is opposed. So now, does someone want to put a motion on the fifth? Thank you. Councillor Shulman. That bylaw number 2295 be read a second time. 
So a second for that motion, Councilor Ryan. Any further discussion on that motion, Councilor Ellis? So if, if new information or new thinking comes to light by within the council, we can present that at the public hearing as well. That's correct. Is that correct, Ms. Wynn? Or our opinion or our We hear from uh, so hear from the public regarding uh, between now and uh, and the public hearing. We can put that information forward as we've heard from uh, from the community, correct? Uh, through your worship, uh, any information that is received by the public would be brought forward to the public hearing and presented by staff in a staff report. Um, and we would go through what we've heard from the public and present it to council. And so if council hears anything, council can present that to your department and you can put that on the docket for the public hearing, correct? Uh, it should go to the manager of corporate services and okay. to their attention. And they will then distribute to us, and then we will make sure that it's done appropriately. And I don't know if Ms. Floyd wants to weigh in, if I've missed anything. Um, th through your worship, no, I don't, don't believe Ms. Wade has missed anything. When we do advertise for the public hearing, we will be very clear on where the public submissions should be received. Okay. All right, so anything that comes to council can be submitted to Ms. Floyd and then she'll present it to, uh, to the planning department and it will come with the public hearing stuff. So if we research something or come up with some new information, we can present that to council. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any further comments, Councilor Ryan? Yeah. Um, in the last few public hearings that we've had, it seems like there's not a lot, it, like the purpose of it is for council to listen to the public and not to provide their own insight. So I just, if that's still the case and the rules haven't changed, I think it's really important that if we have strong feelings one way or another, that we should hash that out right now. So the public who's gonna watch this video or the newspapers who may write articles on it, see some of the justification. And I, I personally, I would love to understand a little bit more on some of the points that you discussed, um, just because I think that is going to set the tone for who shows up and how informed their opinions are, and how much, you know, like what diversity of opinions we get at the table. So. That's okay. So let's vote on uh, unless there's comments on the second. Just a moment, Council. On uh, on the second reading, and we can vote on the second reading, and then we can talk about uh, your, and then before okay. sending it to public hearing. Okay. Sounds good. Council Palmer, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor Soul. So that, that, that's one of the problems when, with going to second reading, and now we're into this officious bureaucratic process, So, we, which we're, we're hearing, and it's typical in, in communities. So now there's this officious way to send information, officious way in which we receive information. It's going to be go, go to the corporate officer. We're not going to see it. We're going to be getting phone calls or emails or whatever individually and then it's all going to be compiled come to the to the uh the public hearing before third reading yes we have to have an open mind for that whole duration and we can continue correct me if i'm wrong but we can express our own opinions even at the public hearing and you worship technically you you have to have an open mind um and it's not there to really express those opinions till after right okay fair enough and then once the public hearing closes, then we're, we can't, that's it. That's it. We can just ponder, we can ask clarification, but that's it. So now we've moved, moved along. So if we get this backlash from the community, which I think there might be some, it's hard to tell uh, if they're aware of it, but we're going to get, if we get this backlash, the public hearing closes, then then we've gone too far. And that's why I was suggesting some of those other things. So I'm just appealing to counsel, you know, this commitment of an open mind at the public hearing. And if there is a, a way that we can be receiving this information or it's compiled somewhere for the public to see as information is coming, instead of having these massive packages that we have to try and navigate at the time, we don't have those mechanisms so that it's easier to to compile all this information. So, so those are some of my concerns. And uh, Mayor Souls, I, I'm, I'm on the fence of the second, the second reading. And the reason why I'm on the fence of it is 
I, I respect that this has been a long process, but it's also been a, a transformative, an iterative process over many, many years. And so we're reciting stuff from years ago as why this is where we are. The, the world has changed from two years ago. And I don't know that we're listening to today's voice adequately. And we're putting too much weight on voices of the past. And so that's, that's one of my concerns is that we're driving this ahead and that we might be making a substantive error because it's going right across all residential zones throughout the community. And I have reticence on that. Um, so I'm partially talking to myself here is, you know, am I going to support the second reading? Because yes, in theory, we can make these corrections if we get the feedback. That's if we get the feedback. But my experience is that in reality, it gets pushed along. And one of the things I don't want to hear, and also might flip out, is how come the public's bringing this up at the third level, you know, 11th hour? This, you know, we've been going through, why weren't you at the community? You know, all that stuff. And the reason why they're coming up at the 11th hour is now it's getting closer to reality and things have changed. So don't let me flip out if I go through that. So that's my little rant. Thank you for the mayor's souls. Councilor Schumer. I agree with you. I, I'm not a fan in the sense that I'm not a fan of the performative routes that we need to take based on legislation. Uh, the, I think the intent behind those regulations is good and it has a point to make sure that a, all of us get the same information to be able to make a well-informed decision as best we can. We never get all the information, but we can do the, with what we get, but that we all get that information, that it's not siloed. Uh, and that we come with an open mind. So I think this council has been very vocal in our desire to get feedback from our community and to listen. We want to hear those things. I can't see any of us saying, because I agree with you, I'd flip out too. Like if anybody calls anyone on bringing information forward at this point, no, this is what we're asking for. This is what we want as a council, is to make the best decision we can with the information we have. And yes, it's already that a lot of the information is old and out of date. So, how do we bring newer information in to our decision-making process, but yet still move forward without letting it get out of date again? Because everything's changing around us so fast in this world. So to try and keep up and make it an iterative process, I'm comforted knowing that we're going into this second reading and public hearing, knowing that there are some hot buttons on this bylaw that may very well get adjusted before third reading. That's what we're looking to hear. And I think in past public hearings that we've been involved with, there wasn't as much wiggle room there. We weren't as aware of any wiggle room, at least. So knowing that going into this public hearing and discussing this, hearing that feedback from the modern voices, the new homeowners, what does this look like so that we can make a solid decision at third reading to be able to bring us forward into that next step? Whether that's the final bylaw, I doubt it. I imagine that future councils will look at it and go, ah, oh, we can make this better. But at least they'll have something to work with. Okay, so Ms. Boyd, just for clarification, as new information comes in regarding short-term rental uh, from members of the community, so we're already receiving emails, telephone calls, that sort of thing, um, and, and they're forwarded on to you. Can that be disseminated to council and become part of the public package, but disseminated to council for us to look at as we await the public hearing uh, and then be part of that? So when we get to the public hearing, I, I'll, I'll let you answer that question now. Well, through your worship, um, what we did for the previous um public hearing for Hay Road, we did post um, the public comments on the website as they came in. So right. that council did have a chance to, to review them in advance. All right. So I see Ms. Wade before I ask my second question. Ms. Wade, you have your hand up. But I'm sorry I didn't see a little hand in the corner here on the screen. Thank you. 
So through your worship, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things that I hear um, being discussed around council table. First of all, we staff has gone through an extensive engagement period with stakeholders in the community over the last year and a half. So it is recent information we have received. Uh, in that consultation, when it came to the cap and restricting the secondary suite, there was no mention from the community that they wanted either of those. That was a result of the conversation at council table and staff responded to um, requests by council to come forward with those motions. We, um, as in staff, have heard um, that people are not happy with the restriction to the secondary suite. Um, and, and staff in their report of June 8th did note that they were not, we were not supportive of that. I do not know of any municipality in the province of BC that has restricted um, short-term rental to a secondary suite because of the housing issues. Um, but that is council's discretion to debate that and modify that if it wishes after it hears from the community and do it at third reading. Um, in regards to the cap, the cap was um, a, a solution that was brought forward to staff as a way to moderate how we bring um, the illegal vacation rentals that we currently have in short-term rentals and how do we bring them into compliance. And based on our study of best practices throughout BC, uh, there's an absorption rate on how those come along how those will come in. In the case of Tofino, it took them three years to actually get to what they had as the illegal um, short-term rentals. So if there's an absorption rate, it'll take time for that to be absorbed. The whole idea of the policy is so that we can revisit this annually and make adjustments as we go along. As we, as we understand more or uh, it changes in the needs um, so that the whole idea of the regulatory framework was to incrementally move forward and adjust as we go and build in flexibility. Uh, staff have heard from the community and that's what all the amendments are based on, is a consultation with the community, with the stakeholders, like our uh, Revelstoke Accommodations Association. We've been to APC, we've been to the Social Development Committee. We've done it on Talk Revelstoke. We did it before just on surveys with SurveyMonkey. So staff have brought forward what we have heard from the community and best practices to try to move this forward. Um, and it's, even though we are aware of the historical information, staff has working very diligently over the last year and a half to bring this forward in a modernized way so that we can start the conversation and move forward. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. So another comment that I have, so uh, Mr. Matusi and Ms. Floyd will ask and weigh in on this. So when we're in the middle of a public hearing and uh, we get to uh, partway through and we want to discuss, uh, or at the end of the public hearing, we want to discuss this, uh, making the amendments and that sort of thing, what are, our, what are the parameters with which we must work in to discuss to make some changes with that before we end that public hearing? Would it need to end it and then make those changes? How does it work? I'll uh, let uh, Ms. Floyd start. Okay, Ms. Floyd. Sure, through your worship. Um, basically, once the public hearing has been closed, no new information can come to you but you can have discussions on information that you've already received. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, because then at that point we can ask for uh, changes of, uh, if we need to make changes or wanna make changes, we can ask for those changes before we deliberate for the night regarding that, correct? That's, no, so sorry, your worship. So what you would do is you would, make the changes, we would bring it back for third reading at a subsequent meeting to allow staff time to amend the bylaw. All right, good, that's kind of just, just making sure that the ability there is there for council to do that, uh, should they have that desire. I believe um, Mr. Matusi mentioned before though that the, the changes can't be substantial in something that hasn't been discussed previously, otherwise that's new information. We would have to rescind second reading and do a redo the public hearing. Your Worship, so I'm at the end of the public hearing, council hears from the public, public says yes to this, no to that. Uh, public hearing is closed, 
the council could then amend the bylaw as they see fit based on that. Um, if, if in that discussion, how you meant it, now a counselor says, uh, I've been thinking, you know, maybe we should do this. That point, I would suggest you have to go back to a public hearing because the public has to hear what councils do deliberate, right? So, uh, yeah, you're free to do what you want. So that gives the opportunity for the community to weigh in. It gives the opportunity for council to make those decisions um, and you're not kind of pigeonholes into that. Is that clear for everyone? So when we get to the third reading and we decide, okay, let's amend it, let's tweak it. We have that option if as long as it's not substantive. That's right, you can amend it, you can kill it, you can improve it as it's. Yeah. Okay, okay. Councilor Palmer. A uh, question for the planner. Uh, regarding the uh, Thomas Brook, so I believe there's some places there that are running vacation rentals. Uh, and I think you were referring to refer to some housekeeping with the OCP. So with the, if this bylaw as it is today uh, was to pass, what happens to Thomas Brook area? Will they be allowed to continue in other places that are interested in vacation rentals? Do they have any other options? Ms. Hoy? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Palmer. So in the case of um, what's before us today, um, if there's a vacation rental that is operating there illegally, they will have to come into conformance with what we're proposing today. If the uh, vacation rental has been a spot zone, it will stay as is. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, the only thing I'm aware of in that area that uh, will be coming before council is there was a temporary use permit for a lodge, which is a very different thing than a vacation rental. And that's something staff is dealing with currently and working with that applicant. And staff is also in consultation with the residents of Thomas Brook in relation to the resort fringe area. They need to have a land use designation to a resort fringe, which would allow um, what we were, we are, we're gonna propose to council, which is a tourist accommodation that will fit something that is greater than three bedrooms, which is in this short-term rental and allow something that is larger in scale um, and it could have a range of bedrooms, but it'll have a maximum number of bedrooms to suit that form of skier, ski hill accommodation that you have talked about. Um, and we would bring that forward for council's consideration. But as part of the OCP minor update, we need to actually give them the appropriate land use. And we do currently do not have a resort fringe. And we think that that's a very appropriate thing for this area. And as we go through the the rest of the OCP update, we will look for areas that may also be um, appropriate for that designation, but that's something on the later conversation of the OCP. Councilor Palmer. Um, thank you, Ms. Wade. Uh, so in the Thomas Brook, is it correct that some of those areas, so I think you were already re referring to it, but just for clarification for me, they're, um, they, currently do not have zoning within the city. Is that correct? Through your worship to Council Palmer, they have the CSRD zoning. Okay, and so as it stands, then they, if they're meeting the CSRD zoning uh, for use, then they're, they're legal compliant then essentially. Correct. And then when this bylaw comes into place, because they already have CSRD zoning, this does not necessarily affect them because they're not res currently zoned residential. Is that correct? So it would. So how the CSRD did vacation rental is they did it by temporary use permit. So that's how they did their temporary use. So that's how a vacation rental was established. So what we've inherited over that. Um, would be under a temporary use permit. And now that they're under, um, and once that expires, then they have to go into a rezoning process. And in order to deal with the rezoning issue, they need the appropriate zoning, which means that they would have to come forward with a rezoning that would reflect what they're trying to do there. And that's part of the housekeeping stuff that we are addressing right now. 
So we don't know which homeowners or which people are running their vacation rentals, what their what their temporary use permit or whatnot is at this point, with the exception of the law, just not correct in this way. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, so as I understand right now, we've inherited when they're annexed in that zoning. Yeah. And then as we, uh, as part of what we need to do is actually update uh, that, that those lands to, first of all, the most important step to amend the OCP to include those lands with appropriate land use designation. Then they can come in with rezoning because they'll be in line with that OCP land use amendment. And that rezoning could be a tourist accommodation um, or it could be a residential zone of some sort and the residential zone would allow short-term rental. So the, the, the reason for the questions on this, uh, Mayor Souls, is because there, there is, my understanding, there is uses that are happening there and there's confusion. So that's why, you know, I know we're, we're having debating basically on the second reading here, but that's it's important for my decision making. So through the, to, to the chair to the planner again, then the, those, the people in the Thomas Brook that have CSRD zoning and possibly temporary use permits may be at risk of losing in their entitlement to their, their current uses with this, uh, this bylaw? Through, through your worship to Council Palmer, no, I don't believe they'd be losing entitlement. And uh, I would have to look at each specific property, what their zoning is, have they got a temporary use permit, and what has happened there. What we are trying to do is bring them in line and actually help them uh, come in to have the ability to rezone their properties to do what they're doing currently, and to also have a mix of uh, tourist accommodation and residential in that zone. Um, so, Mayor, um, what what kind of time? Like to me, there's a I'm just a little bit concerned for that, that area, and then a few other related stuff. But on that area specifically, then. Um, what, what kind of timelines do you anticipate? Like, it sounds like it's quite a bit of stuff that needs to be done. And where are we at for the land use? You know, I don't know if this council has seen anything specifically on the land use uh, reports or anything. Where, where are we and what, where can we anticipate that those issues would be addressed? So the first step is to have the actual land use designation of the OCP, and that will be considered in the minor update that is coming before council hopefully next month. And then we are hopeful what we would like to do is bring this forward for first reading and discussion with council so we can have a healthy debate on this because there's a number of things that um, have been already brought forward to council through committee of the whole, the summary of the OCP that we've been doing over the last uh, almost year. Um, so we do have that information. And so that land use designation for resort fin should be part of that discussion with council uh, as part of the minor OCP update. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Wade. So I'm gonna get back to the motion on the table, uh, reading the bylaw 2295 for a second time. Any further comments or questions regarding that? Council Palmer. Uh, thank you for your patience, Mayor Souls. Uh, um, so I am going to vote in support of the second reading with a bit of reticence uh, because there's a lot of moving pieces here and, I've, and I want to get this right. And we do want to move it ahead. There's a whole host of things and I recognize the difficulty. I would prefer a slightly different process, but I will support the second reading. But based on the information that I've received from staff, I will we'll be supportive of the second reading. I am anticipating that there will be, at the very minimum, minor change, minor changes, and possibly fairly significant changes. As we, so I don't see it as necessarily a smooth sailing going ahead. But I will support the second. Great. Thank you for your comment. I don't disagree with that. So, any further comments on the second reading? I will now ask a question. All those in favor. Opposed. Motions carried unanimously. So there is a public hearing component. Does someone want to put that on 
Councilor Roman. At a public hearing for bylaw number 2295, be scheduled in accordance with S465, section 465 of the local government. Second for the motion, Councilor Sherlet. Discussion on this motion. Councilor Roman. Yeah, um, so this is where I think we should have a discussion because if uh, people from the public who it is, and that if this gets passed, who go to this public hearing will be looking to us to see some of our perspectives. And I'd like to understand a little better the worry of removing short-term rental. Because so I don't think I'm, I'm wrapping my head around it. And I'd like to understand that concern a little better. Sorry, yeah. If if we restrict it to the secondary suite, why that would, yeah. That if I could. Um, balancing the goals of this bylaw is a tricky balance to have because there's two conflicting goals. One is to protect long-term rentals and the housing stock of our community, and the other is to provide a varied accommodation center. And what, like you said earlier, like you said earlier today, anyways, we've talked about it before, we have lots of hotels, we've got new hotels on development, the hotel product in accommodation center is typically one bedroom with several beds in it. Sometimes you can get the suites, but they're usually quite expensive. And to access a spot that you can bring a family in an affordable way and have a kitchen where you can cook, especially for a long-term stay. So vacation rentals and the Airbnb phenomenon was always very popular because then you could bring your whole home, stay in a house. You're not in a hotel with a big party going on down the hallway. Um, and makes it more affordable and attainable as a vacation. It adds to that mix of accommodation sector. So that, sec that was one of the second goals of the, the, re the bylaw, was to encourage that offering. Now, again, like you said, those big, the big homes for rentals is a part of our housing stock. Now, whether those are the same homes, probably not. Like you said, there's some homes up in Aspen Crescent that were purpose-built for a vacation rental that I don't see it ever being an affordable rental for a family, right? They weren't built that way. So that was where I was coming from. Yeah, I'm just more like trying to understand why restricting it to the secondary suite would take away long-term rental. Because in my mind, and I've expressed this before, it's like just a game of numbers. It's like, you know, you have a four bedroom house. Do you want to make the three bedroom upstairs, the vacation rental or the one bedroom downstairs? And I understand that in a lot of cases, let's say there's a four bedroom home and there's a suite in the basement and that's probably being rented out for sure by a long-term tenant. And if we pass this rule, I get that that could potentially kick that person out, but in favor of a vacation rental if we restrict it to the secondary suite. But most of those I would guess are not legal suites, right? Like when we look at the, the, the number of legal suites to the number of suites, I bet most of them aren't legal. So then it becomes a question of, okay, well, who's going to be able to get that le like legal stamp in place, right? It's going to be the people who put the time and money into getting a contractor in there. They have the funds, they, they know they have their shit together or whatever, right? So it's going to be a small group of people. And if we don't restrict it to the secondary suite, then it's going to be the people that have a lot of money who come in and say, wait a minute, I don't, I don't have to put it in the basement. I can just turn the upstairs into that and they can purchase these homes and make them purpose built for vacation rentals in like residential neighborhoods. Right? Like, um, are I going crazy? Like, I'm not... please help me understand where you're coming from. Okay, so let's go back to the scenario that I brought up at the time that you passed this where um, somebody like myself would like to do vacation rental or bed and breakfast, and I'm going to and now live in my suite in the basement. It's suitable for me. I live here. I've lived here for years. Um, but because I've got windows, I've got light coming in upstairs, um, I can now rent to a family that's coming for the vacation rental, or if I want to do the bed and breakfast, I'm actually going to go and take one step further and I'm going to cook for them and that sort of thing. And now they've got that experience of coming like, whoa, I'm getting served like a king. I'm getting my meals or whatever. Even if I'm not providing meals, 
they've got light, they get to see the sun, they get to see the mountains, they get to pack their skis up and go to come back at the end of the day. They have access to the hot tub, all that sort of scenario. And I'm living in the basement knowing that um, I'm providing that experience in one community. So that's kind of how I look at it. If we allow them to utilize either or, then people will have that better experience. So that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be people that come into the community that actually do exactly what you're saying, that are going to buy and say, well, what the hell, I'm going to put, as you put it, a ski bum downstairs, and then we're going to have somebody renting it. And that's do you have a long-term rent? Like, do you have a suite right now? I have a full finished basement. And do you rent it long-term? No. Okay, but I you do. could, I right? Do. And I feel like most people in this market with such low vacancies probably would rent it, right? So in your example, where you're switching, you're going upstairs, downstairs, because you have the flexibility, that's great. That long-term that long -term tenant is out of there. Well, not necessarily, because I'm not renting it now. I'm talking about myself. Yes, as I retire. but I think so, most people, right, probably yeah. have somebody in that and, long -term. And so... Either or. So, you know, I, we can't say that long-term tenants are going to be kicked out, that sort of thing. There is a process of vetting going through this. So I look at it and say, what's going to be the better experience in the community and still entitle our people? So if you've got a long-term tenant and you're now going to um, kick them out for uh, short-term rental. You're going to do it no matter which suite you get to use because you can make your money in three months versus whatever. That's the concern that comes up with this sort of thing. Totally. Right? I completely agree. If you're going to get rid of them for, for no matter what, but like then you're talking about numbers of bedrooms again. So it becomes it comes down to that numbers game. And I completely agree about like making sure we have a quality visit. But I think when we talk about Thomas Brooks becoming that sort of fringe resort fringe kind of area the spot zoned homes, the CE zones where the entire unit is a vacation rental, there's not gonna be a shortage of um, full suite kind of places. I agree that like it's a nice experience to be able to offer that in the downtown core or whatever, but we still have some of those. So it's not like Revelstoke's not gonna have any options. Uh, I think we just have to like look more holistically at the implications of this. I think it's not good at all. Okay. Other, other communities have been resistance of separating the two for a reason. And, and, and uh, you know, Gary wanted to take off for a year, but I lived there for three months of the year. Renting out the space would be vacation rental or long term would be a nice option. So we're eliminating that with just secondary suite. You know, if you want to rent a three bedroom place, come to Gary, you get a whole house. And that's a nice, nice option. He wanted to disappear for three months and have his house generate income for him. That's what we're eliminating. We're just eliminating the secondary suite. So, yeah, but the, I, I agree with you. But, but the she could rent a, I don't know, long term tenant for eight months. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't work. So, I think we're limiting vacation rentals to the 300 who were, were approved, but now we're getting too good basic by separating secondary, primary, extra room, bed, Airbnb. We're becoming very involved in, in what people figure out how to get through living yeah. in our town. And I think that that's, that's a, I agree that that sucks as like a thing that this municipality would put on homeowners or investors or whatever. I get that that's not necessarily our place, but then I also see on the other side, this like extremely challenging housing situation and there being very few levers that we can actually meaningfully make an impact on. And this one seems like a no brainer. Well, I would suggest that this is just a patch. This is only one of a series of things that we should be putting yes. in place. And this is not the panacea. This is not going to solve all our problems. This is just one element of the bigger picture that we need to address. So, so to, to put all our faith in all our problems, and this is a solution to our housing crisis, is a bit misguided. Yeah. Councilor Palmer and Councilor Schaaf, yeah, future Councilor Ronnie. So, you know, what, what your, from your perspective, perspective or your lens, and then there's other lenses that are coming in on this, and this is the complexity. And I think Councillor Elliott is correct in that this is kind of like a band-aid thing. We think it's the solution, um, but we're talking about the entitlement of short-term rentals in residential zones. And yes, there's all this goodwill towards 
enforcement, but you get to the illegal basement suites, that was possibly, and I would say probably, an easier solution to, to address because the way our fees or DCCs or, or charges as far as illegal basement suites go right now, uh, there's very little incentive to, to legalize that and we lose massive amounts of, of revenues from sewer, water, taxation, a whole host of things because we have all these illegal suites. The worst thing we can do is shut them down right away because then, then we're into a bigger, bigger crisis. But to, to create regulation to allow compliance that's more affordable, not paying you know, $2,000 DC, maybe it's more than that, but large amounts for DCCs for vacation rentals that have no real DCC impact. Um, theoretically, they do, but they're yeah, because they're illegal. But it, you know, so we're we're making it cost prohibitive. I think well, I'll use the mayor's example, but the the you know the example that someone that has a suite that makes sense and they're doing a service to the community because it's providing affordable accommodation, but it is illegal at the end at the end of the day we lose all that revenue. So that's one that could be you know by creating incentives to legalize that. There's confusion to, in my mind on the, the vacation rental because it has evolved um, from this vacation rental that could be upstairs, downstairs or wherever. And I had questions earlier about, uh, about the, the, you know, the, the entitlement in the residential zones. And so now we're saying basement suites. I, don't, I actually don't know if there's a requirement for uh, uh, to have a legal suite first or not. And maybe it's a question, but it's, it's sort of getting off top of topic a bit. So there may be some revenues in whether people choose to do that. So there, there's a lot of complex problems and, and that's one of the concerns is, yeah, there's this complexity. We want to get something done. We want to make it a little bit better and we want to make it a lot better in the long term. But I'm concerned that we may have un, unintended consequences that just like the spot zoning which kind of blew up in the community with the previous council. And you know, it, it did provide a lot of solutions, but it also provided a lot of inconsistency and, and unfairness in the community. So those are some of the questions, but that's a little bit off, off topic from that. Sure. Well, I, I think the important part is for us to get something on the table and it'll be refined as we go forward. Hearing the public and, and the input from the community will be important to us. Um, Nothing is perfect, and we, we've seen how we come a long ways in getting this to the table. And, uh, and I think as we move forward, there will be uh, there'll be other things come up. There'll be other conversations. You and I may agree or disagree on, on a lot of things, and they'll come down to what is the will of council? What's the community saying? And I think if we're hearing what the community is saying, we're doing our best to put it into, into motion, then... Uh, that's all that can be expected. That doesn't mean that it isn't going to be refined as it moves along, whether it's this council or other council. Is it for, yeah, for the yeah I, I think it's true. Like, there's always going to be, as Councillor Connor mentioned, there's going to be inequity in whatever decision we move forward with. That's unavoidable. Same with the unintended consequence. There's always going to be some people that have a hand up and some people that get negatively impacted, but we've done our best to set these objectives and staff has done a great job bringing forward these solutions. So I would just urge when we go to this, like all the council and the mayor, when we go to this public hearing, not only to focus, like, <laughs> at, like there's gonna be people that we hear from, but there's gonna be so many that we don't hear from. Right. So, yeah, just please consider that because everybody that we're going to hear from has an incentive to be there. And the, the incentive is almost exclusively money. Yep. And so, like, let's not get, I don't know, caught up in, caught up in that because I think there's a lot that will get missed. Yeah, thanks for that comment. Appreciate it. Councilor Schultz. Uh, I'm interested to see what we do hear from. I think my understanding from the bylaw was that the cap and talking about the suites and having a permanent resident on the property was the intent was to bring more suites legalized, like legalize the location, legalize the suites so that we have more compliance rather than all of these illegal suites that exist in our community. 
Uh, so I think this is helping to contribute towards that pathway to a stronger housing mix. Uh, I agree. I think it is part of the puzzle. This is a complicated, how affordable housing in Canada right now is a huge mess uh, for a lot of reasons. And this is only one part of that puzzle. We are going into a housing action plan this fall and this winter. I think we're going to have some really fulsome discussions with our community about how we move forward in a way that provides housing for all walks of life and all sectors of our community. Because it's not just affordable housing we need. We need professional housing for our professionals that are coming to the community and can't stay. We need housing for the families that can't afford to stay. Um, I think it's important that we give this deep thought, and I think we have and we will be, and that public hearing will be a good opportunity to look at the implications of these decisions we've made. I know I'm going in with an open mind because I think the question of restricting into secondary suites is a hot one. Uh, and I think that's gonna have some big implications for a variety of homeowners. And I hope we do hear from them at the public hearing in September. Great, Mr. Cummings, any further comments on the motion on the table? The public hearing? I'm sorry Councilor? to repeat it, Dead Horse, but I, uh, I completely, yeah, poor horse. I completely agree that we're going to hear from homeowners. We're going to hear from homeowners who may own more than one home. We're going to hear from speculative investors. <laughs> we're going to hear from construction workers or companies who have the incentive to have this pass with, you know, the likelihood that the people that are going to come to them and say, hey, I need a secondary suite put in my house right away. It's not going to be the person who can barely afford it. It's going to be the person who's like, construction is crazy right now. I'll pay your double your rate. Let, like, so just, just make that's sure that that bias is, that lens is on. Thank you for that. Any further comment around the table? Seeing none, I'll ask the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wade, Mr. Simon. Appreciate it. Um, Getting as far with uh, short-term rentals is, is a big thing. Appreciative of that. Okay, we're going to move on to 11A staff reports, uh, community economic development, labor market discussion. Uh, Ms. Brown, do you have a presentation or comments that you want to make before we put the motion on the table? Uh, through your worship, uh, through your worship, you can hear me? Yes, again. Thank you. I've had glitches with my tech today. Uh, no, I don't have a presentation necessarily, although I thought I would just recap some of the um, discussion points in the paper. All right. Thank you. Okay. So this is another tricky issue that's been affecting not just Revelstoke, but other communities across the province. Uh, we've heard from our business community. We've heard from our labor market partners about the shortage in, in, our, in our workforce, especially in the hospitality sector. Um, the missing seasonal workforce that's partly due to the pandemic because of CERB impacting the supply of workers, the mobility of traditional seasonal workers, and then, of course, this surge in, in pent-up demand that's happening as we speak. Uh, we've spoken with this about to the commission. Uh, we've spoken with on this issue to the recovery task force, to RAW, to the Chamber of Commerce. We've met with Work BC, and we've tried to resurrect the working group that initially put together the 2015 labor market study that addressed these systemic issues. So these are not new issues. The pandemic has, has, has made it worse, of course. And I would point out that it's a bit of a zero sum game. Uh, any efforts we make to try and recruit more workers and, and attract more workers to Revelstoke means taking them away from another province, another community, another business. Uh, in our within our community, so it's a, it's a challenge, and the solutions and responses um, are not are not easy, and so uh, what we are are proposing is that we resurrect this this working group that worked on this labor market study. We um, go through some of the key findings, validate those, see who. Um, what kind of gaps there are in programming and service delivery. We update the organizational leads and the capacity of our partners, and we make some recommendations for programming that may be able to help fill these gaps. And, uh, and then we look at, at sourcing funding to carry out some of those services. So all of that is contained in the report put together by our EDO, Jamie Mays, and she's on the call and can answer any specific questions about the content of the report. Any further questions or comments uh, regarding this labor market report, Councilor Shaw? Uh, just a quick comment. I was part of that initial group in 2015. I remember the conversations and sitting there thinking, well, what are we going to do about it? And here we are. And I know some efforts have been tried 
Um, one of the big things I've brought up before, whenever I get the chance to talk to someone from senior government, is how do you reconcile place-based solutions when we are stuck with regional-based policies? And it was causing us grief back then, and it continues to do so. But now, at least, there seems to be more of an appetite to listen and to adjust those policies to be able to provide better place-based solutions. So hopefully by resurrecting that group, there was some really smart brains at that table um, and some good input from the academic sector as well, if I remember correctly. So it's the opportunity is now to try and do something. So hopefully we'll be able to break through some of those barriers that were in the way before. Yes, thank you for that. It's, uh... I don't think there's a sector that isn't hurting because of uh, labor shortage. Even in, uh, in my industry, it's synonymous across the country. Um, trying to get people that are trained, and it's very expensive to train people. The same thing we're all dealing with. How do you house them? How do you feed them? How do you care for them? So I think everyone is feeling this crunch. Um, it's really good that we're discussing this. It, we need to come to a solution, and I don't think we can do that around this table. It's going to take many governments, many uh, iterations of, uh, of government to uh, figure out a way to assist and make this work. Any further comment, uh, Ms. Braun, or questions from, uh, from you or your colleague? Your Worship, not uh, not for myself. Jamie, did you have anything you wanted to add or comments we've we've missed? I guess one of the elephants in the room is is housing. Uh, that is definitely has an impact on our on our workforce supply. Again, systemic and long, long, long reaching, uh, which you know we are working on with development services, hopefully to alleviate that with all of the work that's being done. Okay, Councillor Ryan, and then Councillor Ali. Yeah, this was a really interesting report. Like scary and sad, but interesting. <laughs> Uh, I was just wondering, like, is, are you looking maybe, like, do we need a motion to, uh, in the report it says that following discussion with business service organizations uh, that your department is proposing that they get involved in reconvening, like, do we need to make that motion or is that just something that's going to happen? Uh, through your worship, no, that's not required. Uh, we've already actually pulled together the group and had an initial conversation so that we could ensure that they were supportive of this this suggestion that you know we're basically reconvening, uh, taking another look at the issues, seeing how, how the pandemic has changed things, who has capacity, who has services, is there a gap, how do we fill the gap, and then if there is some suggested programming or services that that CED is in a position to uh, act on, we would come back to council with a report uh, looking for funding opportunity or programming opportunity. Okay, awesome. Right, thank you. So there's a motion on the table to receive this report. Oh, thank you, Ms. Braun. Uh, what about, uh, it doesn't present much positive news in your report. We're in a desperate situation, but, but the foreign worker uh, getting people in from out of, out of country, has there been any investigation or progress on, on streamlining that process? Uh, through your worship, that's uh, goal four on the summary recommendations that we attach to the um, to the report, and there is ongoing conversation with the powers that be to to look at that. A lot of that has been put on on the back burner because of the pandemic. And uh, Jamie Mays may be able to speak more to that. She pulled together and you know kind of summarized the um, the findings of that 2015 study for you. Jamie, did you have anything to add? I know that it's it's an ongoing conversation around the table at Okanagan College with WorkBC, uh, with our other labor market partners. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, one thing I would add is, is that one of the limitations that I recall is that um, the information that they work on immigration looks at is, 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 is a larger regional uh, issue. And so we don't necessarily stand out in terms of our specific labor force needs. Um, Jamie, did you have anything to, to add about that? You were a little closer to that information. Yeah, I think you've captured it well. Um, the federal and provincial government are definitely reassess reassessing labor policy as it relates to immigration programming to support um, recruitment and attraction of our 
immigrant workforce. Um, so I think it's something that we just need to keep our ear to the ground on and be in tune with. And as uh, Ms. Braun mentioned, uh, definitely understanding how we can better capture localized labor market data and have that inform programming at a provincial and federal level. That there's a lot of work that we can do and opportunity um, with that regard. But again, we will have that discussion uh, sometime over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, I've requested a meeting on behalf of Council with the Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, dealing with uh, the labor market and the uh, foreign worker program. We've had that discussion a couple of years ago. We're going to reinvigorate uh, that conversation again and see if we can help to speed up the process for our community members who are looking to bring people into the community into work. So thank you for that. Any other comments, Councilor Elliott? I, I just wonder if, there, I know the system that's in place to recruit foreign workers is pretty, uh, it sure. involves, yeah, it's, it's quite an ordeal. I, I know personally that, uh, you know, the business my wife is involved with, she's trying to recruit someone from out of town, but she's engaged with a lawyer on her own. And I'm saying, as a community, could we not uh, pool that effort and recruit more and say, I wonder if that's something that the chamber or, or the economic development could get in touch with an immigration lawyer and say, listen, what can we do to 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 enhance the effort? I don't Any comment, uh, Ms. Mays, regarding that sort of thing? And then I'll just wait. Yeah, I can speak to that. I think I think one comment I would make is that is that pan-sectoral approaches may not necessarily be what is needed. Um, I think right now, what the marketplace is doing to alleviate the situation uh, is, is our best bet in some ways until we have that policy change at, at different levels of government. I think one of the things is we found when we when we took some initial ideas about how, how we could work together to recruit more workers to the to the community, we took it back to RAW and to the chamber and to a recovery task force. And some of the feedback was lukewarm at best. And I think that's because the only competitive advantage that some of the employers have locally is their compensation package. So they're competing against each other. So, so if we're doing some kind of recruitment effort across the community, they lose that competitive advantage. And, and sometimes uh, it's, it's to their benefit to have their own uh, packages they're putting out there, whether it's offering a ski pass or accommodation or extra, you know, higher wages. And so, so a pan, a pan Canadian or pan community approach is not necessarily um, desired or workable. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. So, yeah, I know individually the, the expense of recruiting a foreign worker is, is expensive for one entity. Uh, you know, if there was a blanket form, do one lawyer for 20 foreign workers would make a lot, a lot more sense. And I wonder if there was a pooling of requests rather than getting up with 20 different lawyer cases involved in it. It might be a, a way I, to I think. You know, probably one of the conversations we, we can have that conversation, uh, but some of the uh, businesses that are doing that are requesting exactly as Ms. Braun has stated, um, let's let us do it on our own. We can get uh, more. The problem is, is that they do have to guarantee accommodation and that sort of thing coming forward. And, and so some of these uh, some of these businesses have had to buy a house, had to buy apartments, that sort of thing, and make it work. And, and that's the only way that they can actually stay in business. So uh, it's a hard go, but I think we need to have a conversation with the uh, provincial government and just see if they have some input as to how we can make this work better. And I, yeah, the federal provincial government has a speed. It's not very really conducive to a person hanging on with a finger. Well, what I've seen during the pandemic has been actually fairly quick. So I think we need to have those conversations no matter what. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anything further, Ms. Brown? Your Worship, no. I, that's, that's Councilor, do you like the other comment? I do, and I think Councilor Palmer had his hand up earlier. Okay. Because he might have an answer to that. Um, thank you, Your Souls. Uh, first of all, I'll put the motion on the table to report on the labor market snapshot. Community economic recovery be received for Information. Second, or Councilor Shalat. Any further discussion? No comment. Yeah. So, uh, just further on the conversation that's been going on, going on. I know individuals that are essentially growing up in Canada, high school, and through programs, and now want to eventually become Canadians. But they can't even 
get a work permit. It's like a year, a year. This, these are federal things. And so we're talking about all these, you know, sort of community level or the provincial level, but the, the, in, everybody's using COVID as an excuse for everything under the sun these days. Mm -hmm. But the reality is why couldn't the federal government get things sorted out so we can get the workers, because this is affecting the Okanagan, it's farm workers, we're not gonna get produce off the land. We know what's happening in Revelstoke, you can't get a, a beer after council meeting because there's no workers, you know, and so then, then that's hurting the businesses. So there's this, and so I, I just wonder if there's maybe something for us to think about is a little bit more active, even though we're one little voice, but maybe start to have compound voices, starting with uh, our member of parliament and maybe remind, remind the, the Liberal government that our MP locally is, is conservative. And so maybe they should start to do, do something. I know it'd be exactly the same thing as the, uh, the flip, but you know, we need to make it easier for people to get into Canada that, want, that have skills and want to work here and make contributions to our society. Uh, if, if this is the kind of community we want to be in. So there's a big problem here. So it's not just the housing, it's we it can't get those, those workers back in. So that's something to think about. Uh, you know, maybe we, you know, through a policy session, we have a further dialogue and maybe start actively uh, becoming a little bit noisier and start joining with other communities saying we really need uh, workers. I know it's a big issue in Ontario, Okanagan, probably everywhere. Thanks, Councilor uh, Schultz. Yeah, I agree. If, if we are going into a federal election this fall that we're talking about, hopefully that conversation will be coming up. Um, I think a couple of points I just wanted to make real quick. One, on the idea, I agree with Councilor Elliott that as much as I appreciate that the feedback has been that the businesses, the large businesses would rather go it alone with immigration when it comes to small business, it's not always so practical, but I would hope that the Chamber of Commerce would be there to support those individual businesses more so than the municipality. Um, another point is, and I haven't brought this up in a while, but it is still on my radar, is this strength we have with community engagement and collective impact. And when we're talking about the labour market, I would hope that with that labour market snapshot, one part that I really appreciated at the last one in 2015 was that there were people from the workforce at the table. Uh, the people with lived experience, the immigration, the immigrants that are here that want to work, what has their experience been? And having them at the table while we discuss this is so invaluable. And I would hope that youth and transient workers are part of that conversation as well as that immigration side. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Any further comment on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Mays. Appreciate it. Development Services, Development Permit DP 2020-27. We have a presentation, 719 Track Street. Mr. Simon, Ms. Wade. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Let me share my screen here. There we go. Can everyone see the uh, the PowerPoint presentation on the screen? Yes, we have it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the development permit application that we have before council consideration today is a development permit that falls within one of our environmentally hazardous development permit areas. And this DP is specifically to facilitate the development of an electric vehicle charging station. So staff are recommending approval of this development permit. Um, and we are also recommending council authorization to enter into a license of occupation with the applicant as a portion of the electric vehicle charging station actually is located within city right of way. And we'll get into some more details on that now. So we'll give you a basic overview of the background followed by proposal details with uh, and then conclude with policy direction and staff recommendation will reiterate. So the application is proposing to construct a, a building as well as for uh, electric vehicle charging station infrastructure. Uh, it's located at the northeast end of the Revelstoke Railway Museum parking lot. And as you can see from the image here, a portion of it is actually located uh, in what is actually the city right of way. So the Railway Museum property is zoned parks and public use, so P1 and this falls within the environmentally sensitive and environmentally hazardous development permit area. 
So getting into some details of the proposal now, uh, the proposal is for land alteration slash construction in an environmentally hazardous area. Specifically, this is the unstable soil area, which basically means we need to get additional geotechnical analysis undertaken to make sure that all construction is undertaken in a safe manner. So the applicant has submitted that geotechnical assessment that will be appended to the development permit and a covenant will be registered on title, ensuring adherence to the findings of that geotech report. So as indicated, you can see here in green, this is the area where the charging station infrastructure will be located. And as you can see, a portion of it actually falls within the property boundaries of the Revelstoke Railway Museum. And then this other portion where you can see it's located in the red area here, this is actually city right of way. And that is where we need authorization from council to actually do the license of occupation. I will note that this license of occupation is an interim measure. So as you can see here, the purple portion in the, in the diagram here, this is actually the traveled roadway. This is where if you're going to the museum, the road that you would actually travel upon. This is where the city infrastructure, including servicing infrastructure is actually located. This right of way where, the, where it actually is in the red, that's really the parking lot of the museum. So the license of occupation is an interim measure until staff can work with the applicant to actually do a land swap so that we have proper delineation of the public road right of way. So some details of the proposal, um, pretty high level, it includes four fast vehicle charging stations. There's an equipment enclosure uh, building for some of the more significant pieces of infrastructure. There's a utility transformer and then a retaining wall that will go around the rear adjacent to Farrell Road. And this is intended to protect from any vehicular collision to make sure that access along Farrell Road is, is maintained. So when we look at the policy direction that is applicable from the official community plan for this proposal, basically the policy guidelines say we prohibit development within these environmentally hazardous areas and less a professional does an analysis that proves development can be undertaken in a safe manner. In this particular circumstance, a geotechnical assessment has been provided and has been reviewed and has been uh, ultimately determined by staff that the development can be undertaken in a safe manner. So again, just to conclude with the staff recommendation, we are looking for a resolution from council to authorize the CAO to enter into a license of occupation for that portion of the infrastructure that's within city right of way. And then staff are recommending issuance of the development permit subject to um, one condition, that being the geotechnical analysis actually being registered on title. Thank you, this concludes my presentation. Great, thank you, Mr. Simon. All right, council, can I get someone to put the motion on the table, please? And yeah. number one. Okay. Can I just point where can we take a quick washing break? Sure. Uh, if not, Okay, no, yeah. go, let's stop, let's go. We'll take a quick break and then, uh, and then we'll come back and put it on the table. So anyone else want to go? Uh, you can have a quick smoke. The vacation I know. It is tricky. We live in some interesting times. That's why, that's why it's your decision. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why they put the most unqualified people in charge. Perfect. Well, they don't. So you're the, you're the, the community. You're the candidate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So you do your best. You know what they need? The worst thing you could do? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's it. They really can't after a while. Well, it's been six years. <laughs> We're at that point. <laughs> True for me is this. The hotels want because it's protecting their business and they use it as convenient to be rich. Right. So, so, what do you mean? They want what? They want a cab on the I don't care so much about the cab. If it was restricted to secondary suite, it's like, fuck, who cares about the cab? Well, the gist is. Pardon? Oh. Oops. <laughs> so, so, we're still. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. No.
All right. Uh, thank you for your patience, uh, community. We just took a little comfort break. Uh, we're going to get back at it, so I'm going to ask for someone to make uh, a motion to put 11B on uh, on the table. Councilor Chauvet. That the mayor and chief administrative officer be authorized to sign the license of occupation agreement with Electrify Canada for the use of the city right of way located at the southwest junction of Track Street and Carroll Road for the purposes of installation of electrical electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Any uh, second for that, please? Councillor Elliott, any discussion on that part of the motion? Um, yeah, Councillor Palmer, then uh, Councillor Brooksville. Um, so, almost it almost seems to me that the two motions are tied together because one is conditional on the other. But so my questions are hit on both. So th this is on the um, the property, uh, and Mr. Simon. You talked about that this is a temporary thing, so putting the land swap, and that makes sense to me. Um, I, I probably as part of the second part, I I I, I would like to see that that land swap is a condition of that. And I'm, I'm not sure if there's a way of doing that to make sure that it actually gets done because we've had that, that problem. So there, our road basically goes through on the museum property. It feels like a road, but it's really their property. And really what we need to do is legitimize, correct me if I'm wrong, but legitimize that road and then take what is our road and make that formally their parking lot and it almost seems to me, ideally, that would be done first, but it's not done at this point. But would it make sense to you that for council to put that as a, that yes, we can proceed, but there's a, a notice of title or something, a requirement of that, that road, the land swap being complete? I don't know if you have any comment. It might be more of an engineering thing too, I'm not sure. Look through your worship, it's a separate legislative process to actually pursue a land swap. So from staff's perspective, we would recommend against putting any type of condition on that. Staff are well aware that this needs to occur. The city has an interest in pursuing this land swap, given that the traveled portion of the right of way, as well as the servicing that the city will need access to is actually located within that portion that we don't have secured right now. So even without a, you know, a council condition you know, directing us to to do that, staff will be pursuing this land swap. And I would also note too, it's it's in the interest of the, the Railway Museum as well as Electrify Canada and staff have been in discussions for quite some time. There's been multiple technical elements to sort out with this proposal when we actually got it and it went out for referral, um, but staff are aware that this is more of a long-term solution to do the land swap and that the license of occupation is an interim solution that allows this this infrastructure to get constructed sooner. So, um, yeah, so I, I understand that and I'm not wanting to hold up, you know, moving ahead, but m the concern that I have is, so this, this concern about the, the land has been there for decades, I believe, and, um, and I can't remember the details, but like the water, water and sewer, are they in the, I think there's water and sewer going through some components, I think there's maybe even an easement somewhere. Has that been looked at? Uh, through your worship, yes, staff have looked at it. And as far as we are uh, aware, there is no statutory right of way that would actually grant formal access to the city, which is why there is an interest for us to pursue the land swap, um, even without a, a council resolution directing us to do so. so no. And I'm a bit confused as to why we couldn't put that as a requirement. The concern is we do this license of occupation and then the land swap gets bogged down, is it rectified or we find some other problem? Again, it, it seems to me it's the wrong way around, but at the same time, I think it's important to get this infrastructure and this, the charging stations there. Um, so w w why would council not put that as a, a I'm, I understand that it's a separate legislation, but some, some weight in the agreement so that it forces the the issue through, through your worship so the license of occupation agreement does actually identify this as an interim measure until such time that the road swap actually occurs um so there is already language within the license of occupation itself that does reference that and, and is, is there time is there a timeline attached to that 
uh, through your worship, it would be essentially until the infrastructure is going to be decommissioned. The license of occupation is valid until the infrastructure is decommissioned or until such a time that the land swap does occur. There is no specific time frame as to when that land swap needs to occur. Um, and it's a, it's a matter of working with the applicant, completing necessary servicing or uh, surveying rather, and then ultimately registering, you know, statutory right of ways where needed. It's a bit of a technical administrative process to do that. And staff are gonna be working with the owner to pursue that. Um, so through the mayor, um, it, 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 I, I'm not fully understanding why we would put it as a, a very specific so that there's a covenant to force force that land swap. Because I guess what I'm seeing is we're going to do this and we're just making a messy situation even messier for somebody in the future. And if there's no timelines or motivation, like we're very... We're busy, so I, I understand all the good intentions, but as, as soon as there's some problem, then we, we don't proceed with it. Um, I guess that's where my concern, and, uh, and then even the note about, you know, where the utilities are, was the, the utilities weren't on your, uh, in your report, were they? Your Worship, no, there's no, there's no map that showed the utilities. Um, staff don't have, major concerns with pursuing the option in this way. It does allow the construction to go forward without being inhibited by the um, time it would take to actually complete the land swap and follow the proper legislation to do so. Okay, okay one more and then I'm gonna to go to Council Okay. okay. Uh, and then without seeing, it's, it's, uh, is the engineer on, online? Cause I'm just wondering like with the water and sewer, how that's going through there. It, it, Cause I'm, I just have a discomfort as to not knowing that and how that impacted the impact of, of that. Mr. Black, would you like to weigh in, please? You're muted. Uh, my apologies as uh, Director Wade indicated it was changing technologies and I had to find the unmute in the other corner of the um, box. Um, to Councillor Palmer, yes, there are numerous uh, utilities, um, including road um, on, in that section of town, which are not in public right of way. And it will be a ma major effort in the long term in order to uh, correct and adjust and ensure that we have easements and statutory rights away where existing infrastructure is. Um, and so at this time, um, we do not have the capacity to, as, as uh, um, Mr. Simon indicated, to push uh, cleaning all of this area up at this time. And again, staff is of the opinion that providing this uh, service to um, the electric vehicle fleets, which are continuing to grow and, and supported by staff is very important for us to execute sooner than later. Um, whereas we can address the uh, right ways and utilities in the future without impacting this project. Councilor Brooks Hill. Um, so I share some of Councillor Palmer's concerns. My my the, my basic concern is that we're giving over city land, which really shouldn't be city land, but it's city land to a large, as far as I can tell, foreign-owned corporation, which uh, you know it's called Electrify Canada, but it's a partnership between Volkswagen and. Electrify America, which I assume is American. I didn't look into it that far, but um, you know, I I'm totally in favor of building more electric charging stations, and I think that this location is a great place to do it. And you know, the fact that the city owns the land is basically just an accident. It should basically be the museums, but that basic premise of this is city owned land that is being 
essentially rented to a large foreign corporation makes me uncomfortable. And so the fact that a land swap, you know, obviously it's going to be complicated. And I know the whole CP Hill area is basically a mess completely. If you look at the map and compare it to reality, it's very different. Um, so, you know, I'm willing to vote in favor of this as an interim solution, but I would like to see it get resolved sooner rather than later. Okay, hey, Councilor Palmer. Um, thank you, Mayor Souls. So, uh, I as it stands right now, I'm not supportive because I see that, first of all, I'll, I'll talk to the, the merits of the charging stations. So, they're important. It's where our community, the whole world is going to electric vehicles. I'm not going to go into that whole debate right now, but it makes sense for the museum. To me, it makes sense to want those charging stations because then people come from wherever, stop, they come into our town, that's great. Uh, they go there and then they're going to be customers while they're waiting for their vehicle to get charged and then hopefully spend time in Revelstoke. So all that makes sense. But it is big corporate and it is a future, in my, in my view, encumbrance on the city. And so this is going to be something that we are going to pay for if we try and fix this in the future. And so to me, it is the cart before the horse. I, I you know, I, there's the part of me that says, yeah, this makes really, really good sense. And intuitively it makes sense until you start to understand more of the utility, the underground utilities. And we've heard from the engineer that that's already a mess. So without that information, without more information, I could not be supportive. And I guess I'd sort of wonder whether it would make, make more sense for uh, the, those charging stations to be, you know, in, on, on private land, whether that's the museum on the private portion or somewhere else, you know, figuring it out or, you know, wherever it belongs. <coughs> So I'm conflicted, but I just, it's, without that complete information, without the cleanup, I, quite frankly, I think they should be able to hire the engineers and get this all sorted out uh, so we don't have, even have to use staff time. So that's my position on this at this point. I'd be, in, I'd enter, entertain an amendment to this, but I'm not comfortable with the way this has presented. Okay, any other comments from councils around the third? So, I'm sorry. Did the railway museum initiate this response, or is it coming from like five ten? Mr. Simon, Miss Wade, I know you're shaking your head yes, but can you uh, just clarify verbally for the public, please? So, through your worship, that's um, yeah. One point I wanted to make: while well, the applicant's not here, this is in tandem with the Revelstoke Rail Railway Museum. Electrify Canada does have an agreement with them that oversees all of this infrastructure that is being constructed. Um, we have been working with the museum on this. The museum does want to see this push ahead. So there is a local element to this as well that is quite important. Um, and it is an important revenue stream as well to lease this out for the, uh, for the museum. So it's one point that uh, I think is important for council to be aware of with respect to this licensed occupation. Okay, thank you. Councilor Palmer and Councilor Elliott. So do, do we have that agreement, a copy of that agreement? I don't, I don't recall it. Is there a copy of that agreement with the uh, railway and the uh, Electrify Canada? Uh, through your worship, yes, we have a copy of the, the license occupation that we were finalizing. And what we were looking for is a, it's a technical legal agreement that just allows them to occupy that portion of the city right of way, specifies details that, you know, should they decommission the infrastructure that they need to repair the land to its previous state. And we were just looking for a council uh, resolution to actually enter into that agreement and allow the, the CAO to sign off on it. Councilor so, so the right away that we're talking about, is, is that the existing part of the, the railway's parking lot? Yes. Three or okay. yes, that is correct. So basically we're not changing anything. We're just giving up some of our parking lot to put charging stations on, on that chunk of land. Right. Is that right? Through your worship, yes, that is correct. The The current layout of their, their parking lot is not changing. The right of way goes over the parking lot area, like Mr. Black had indicated, does need to be cleaned up. 
but it is uh, it does take time and it is a capacity issue and this area has multiple instances of that. So there's been no aversion to using the right of way for parking by the railway museum. Correct. Through your worship, that is correct. And if anything, this license of occupation for this particular area actually provides the city with a bit more of a formal arrangement to establish the use of the right of way for its intended purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Palmer. Yeah, so just for clarity, that it's not just a parking lot, it's it's land. So there's the roadway, which there's a, a, a legal roadway that goes through there that they're building on. That's the land. I believe that's a roadway, is it not? That portion of land, or is there no road? That's probably an engineering question again, or maybe it's planning. Through your worship, Councillor Palmer, as you can see on the map here, the purple indicates the traveled portion of the roadway, which is technically through the Revelstoke Museum's land. The red is the city right of way. This is what's being used as a, as a parking area for the museum currently. And then the green shows how a portion of it is on Revelstoke Museum land and a portion is going to be on, uh, on city right of way. So for, for clarity, the red portion of which the green is on top of that red portion, is it just simply city land or is it, is it road? From a from an engineering perspective, I know it's not. It's just a parking lot from the lay person's perspective, from my perspective, and everybody else. It feels like a parking lot, but is that actually the red portion of legal road? Your worship, it's it's a statutory right of way area. It is not the actual roadway. So there's no road because the purple portion. I guess the question is the per purple portion is basically an encroachment, the city's encroachment using it that feels like a road, but that is not a, a dedicated road specifically. Through your worship, that is correct. And to the, the best of staff's knowledge, because again, I think it's important to understand the context of how these situations come about. A lot of these survey plans date back to 1897, 1907, quite old plans that were completed without necessarily having the, the proper boots on the ground to do the survey work. And in this particular circumstance, staff could wager a, an educated guess as to why the traveled roadway is where it is. It might have had something to do with working, uh, working with the rail line to actually get a crossing over there. Um, but you know, to the best of staff's knowledge, we can't understand as to why the situation is the way it is right now. All we can do is move forward and try and clean it up and allow development to occur that in staff's view is beneficial for the city while having interim solutions to not stall those developments while we work on the long-term solutions to actually address the matter. All right, I have another comment. Yeah, just for clarity, but what we heard from the engineer, there is no plan for that long-term solution at this point. And I guess the question I have is, why could we not require the applicant to provide the, you know, the, require the, this, the, the whole area to get cleaned up as far as the land swap and legalize the road. It doesn't really matter what the history, we have what we have, but why, why would we not get this stuff fixed up at this time and that be a requirement for the, uh, the developer? So it's a question. So uh, through your worship, and um, I, I, I believe what Mr. Black was referring to is that this entire area along Farrell Road and Track Street has numerous instances where the right of way doesn't necessarily follow the travel portion of the roadway and to clean all of that up would be quite a, quite a, a long term task to complete. And that with respect to this particular circumstance that is before Council today, it is on staff's radar and because this has been brought to our attention now we will be working with the applicant to clean it up. We'll note that again, this is a, an interim measure with a license of occupation to allow this development to go forward. Um, again, I, I can't speak directly for the applicant, but based on staff's conversations with them, it is a longer term solution and it does take more work and, and costs associated with that to actually do the land swap. And I, I, I can't confirm whether or not this project would be, would be viable without this interim solution moving forward. So Mr. Matusi, please. Well, no, you're right, but I was just I think um, Mr. Simon just clarified. What I was going to ask is part of the problem is that the, the that outcome may be more onerous than this project could handle. Yeah. And that's the ultimate concern is that this is going to get done 
But if this was put on the backs of the museum right now, it might make this all about. And that was, thank you, Mr. Simon, because that was what I was going to ask. That one, yeah. that was another. They can afford it once it gets this put in place, and then they'll be able to afford moving it as I. So, correct. Oh, sorry. Mr. Simon? Sorry, uh, sorry through your worship, I couldn't hear the question there. So, it, just as you had stated, uh, a little onerous on them now to deal with that, but as they move forward, they'll be able to have some funds and be able to help the city with that line spot. Is that correct? Through your worship, that would be the overall intent, and staff would be working with them to actually determine the, the proper procedure to go through that land swap and the necessary surveys that are required, as well as legal agreements like statutory right ways. Great. Thank you. Mr. Palmer, do you have one last comment? <clears throat> yeah, two. Uh, so one question, one comment. So the the, uh, the timelines for the, the land swap? So through your worship, it is something that staff would hope to complete and get working on uh, shortly thereafter. I can't give you a, a definitive timeline of when it would actually be completed. Because again, it will be dependent on working with surveyors to come out and actually survey the land, which is required to complete the land swap. And most surveyors, you know, as we start to look forward into the coming months, wouldn't be able to come out here and complete the necessary survey work throughout the winter. So it would be something that hopefully we'd be able to bring forward, um, if not this year, then the next year for council consideration. So by next year, we'd have the land swap and right away is corrected? Uh, through your worship, I could uh, wager that that would be a, a good estimate of the time. Um, again, there's multiple items that are currently in, in the workload and in the hopper for staff to complete. So I, I'm reluctant to give a specific time as to when this would ultimately be completed, especially when it's dependent on others' jobs coming out here and working and actually doing the survey work and completing all that. So I, I can't give a definitive timeline as to when that would be completed, but staff's preference would be as soon as possible and hopefully next year. And, and is there a, do we know if there's any water, sewer, or storm lines adjacent or going underneath the green portion? Through your worship, your worship. I would, uh, defer to uh, Mr. Black on that. Through your worship, um, if I can share uh, a screen here, let me see if I can make this happen. Oh. Can you see this now? Yep. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm trying to get a, um, a, a geocortex up of this area. There is uh, water, uh, storm, and sanitary pipes, which are um, outside of even the existing track street drive aisle, which is private property and not within the um, right of way where this facility is proposed to go. In addition, there's a sewer line that runs um, north. Um, I'm sorry, I, uh, there's another sewer line that runs uh, basically straight north from uh, um, uh, the, the, the crossing at Track Street um, through private property um, a water line that runs uh, through also private property going north from that area. And so we have numerous facilities that are um, impacted by, uh, by this project. And so we will need to, oh, and Paul, it looks like if you stop sharing, I might. We see you now. Yeah. And so, are we? I'm hopeful. There you go, Steve. Ah, oh, finally. I, my apologies, Council and Mayor. Um, hopefully, you can now see the um, the layout here of of what's going on from a, a utility and infrastructure point of view. And so, there's there's numerous pieces of uh, the puzzle that need to be rearranged and um, easements in addition to. Uh, re 
uh, swapping the, the right of way, there's easements that will also need to be acqu acquired and negotiated to um, address sewer and water and storm drain, which are even outside of a future right of way. So the, 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 the answer here, Councillor Palmer, is that we have a, a lot of work to do because our utilities were placed at a time when the easiest path to, to the solution was followed and not necessarily the uh, putting everything in the proper location. Um, this is just one instance. If, um, if we go further along here to the north, you can see I've got water lines encroaching on properties at various locations on, on uh, Farrell. Um, you can see the sewer line that's also crossing uh, four parcels, or I'm sorry, two parcels going to the north and then northwest. Um, so there's a lot of pieces to, to deal with here. So it's just not um, this one piece that needs to be addressed. It's a comprehensive look at the whole neighborhood. And that's why um, staff is of the opinion that yes, it does need to get cleaned up. Um, it's been this way. F I believe some of these pipes are, have, were installed in the 40s and 50s. And so we're looking at 60 to 70 years of existing conditions that we're trying to remedy sometime in the future. Um, However, right now, um, we do not have the bandwidth to do that. As uh, uh, Paul indicated, um, we will make it a priority to get to, but um, we need some staff and some bandwidth to make that happen. Chris says that there is none of the infrastructure running under where this is gonna be built. So that's a positive there. So, all right, any further comments or questions regarding the motion on the table? Seeing none, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of number one, opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. Number two, someone put that on the table for me, please. Councilor Chouette. The development permit DP 2020-27 be approved, 719 Track Street, as is on the screen. Great, second for the motion, please. Councilor Elliott, any further discussion on that motion? I think we just went through that whole discussion dealing with the right of way and whatnot. Um, so I'll ask one more time, any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Moving on to item 2A. Um, someone wanna put that on the table, please. Yes. Chart two, was that? Is that the uh, owner registers a covenant? Did we not do that separate or is that included? Is that all right, good. Thanks. So we'll carry on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, staff. Appreciate that. We're going to move on to item 11C, development permit uh, 2021 011 20, 1240 Powerhouse Road. We have a presentation, uh, Mr. Simon or Ms. Wade. Your Worship, yes, we do. Thank you. If there's any issue seeing my screen, please let me know. Uh, as indicated, we have a development permit application for a commercial industrial development permit. It's for form and character of a 11 unit mixed use building located at 1240 Powerhouse Road. So staff are supportive of this development permit and do recommend approval. So we'll go through some background, the proposal details, and then conclude with the policy direction and associated staff recommendation that we can reiterate. So along Powerhouse Road at 1240, there is a multi-phase development that is currently underway. Phase three was approved by, by council in 2020 for a development permit and their building permit was issued shortly thereafter. This is phase four of four at 1240 Powerhouse Road subject lands or zone comprehensive development zone 16, which do allow for um, vacation rental style uses uh, known as recreational uh, commercial accommodation on the upper floor, and then a multitude of commercial and industrial oriented uses on the main floor. It does fall within development permit area C, which is the commercial industrial development permit area. And as such, all new construction does require a development permit to guide the form and character. So getting into some details of the proposal, we look at the building layout. Uh, we have each unit which contains a one bedroom and a den, as well as a washroom, living room, kitchen, and covered deck. Then the main floor does include open space for industrial and associated commercial uses. When we look at the overall site, uh, you can see as part of phase three, 
parking and landscaping provisions were provided for. So you can see in red here, these are the existing buildings, number one and building number two. Building number three was a 14 unit kind of L-shaped structure that is currently under construction. And the applicant is now looking to secure approval for the final phase of the development being phase four for an 11 unit building. Uh, as required and staff were working with the applicant throughout the development of phase three. Uh, we addressed all the parking requirements for both phases three and phase four to make sure that there was sufficient parking as well as landscaping requirements that are required as per the comprehensive development zone. So the CD zone requires one tree per 10 meter of frontage as well as one shrub per one meter of frontage. And you can see highlighted in green here, this was their, their basic site plan that shows some of the landscaping and all the landscaping provisions as per the requirements of the CD zone were addressed with phase three development and associated approvals. So looking at some of the details of the actual design of the building. So some of the materials that they're looking at using Westman clad uh, steel cladding, so coffee brown and tan colors on the facade, white overhead doors and trim, white aluminum uh, window frames, and then flashing to match the colors of the adjacent surface. Uh, the adjacent surface, sorry. This is the same design that they had implemented for building number three. So it does provide for continuity with the development. When we look at the applicable policies from the official community plan as detailed in the staff report. Uh, staff do uh, have reviewed and the application is in line with these development permit area guidelines. So there's provisions for forming character to make sure that the scale mass of the buildings, the materials used and the colors chosen are in line with the character of the neighborhood. There's provisions to make sure that the proposed development doesn't have an impact on the surrounding uses. In this particular circumstance, it's surrounded by commercial industrial, so staff do not anticipate any offsite impacts, especially because most of the activities are all gonna be carried on within a building, aside from some minor parking and loading. When we look at landscaping requirements, as indicated as part of phase three, all the landscaping provisions that are embedded as requirements in the comprehensive development zone, have been addressed with that permit and associated bonding was provided for. Uh, again, with parking, parking was provided for as part of phase three was identified to be feasible and staff don't have any concerns with the proposed 80 parking stalls that are, are identified for both buildings three and four. And then garbage and recycling screening, which is provided for as part of this development where they are maintained within each individual unit. So again, to conclude, staff are recommending approval of the development permit for the new mixed-use building located at 1240 Powerhouse Road. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Is there someone who would like to put this motion on the table, please? Councilor Brooksell. The development permit DP 2021-011 be approved at 1240 Powerhouse Road as in package. Second for the motion, Councilor uh, Palmer. Any discussion on the motion? Some questions uh, through the mayor. Um, so mixed use, just on the, uh, so can, can you uh, specify, so there's a residential component. It can also be used for commercial, some commercial types of uses in industrial. Is that correct? Through your worship, yes, that is correct. Residential is permitted as a, as a use on the upper floor of these buildings. Specifically, it's uh, referred to as a commercial recreational accommodation, which is very similar to a vacation rental. And uh, just the potential for industrial conflicts with, you know, future conflicts with the uh, residential portion. So it, is there restrictions on the industrial uses? Uh, through your worship, the uses that are permitted within there are typically more service commercial oriented. So such as auto body repair shops. I mean, the intent here was for people that are gonna be kind of staying upstairs have the potential to you know, take care of their sleds on the main floor. Um, so that's kind of how this development was ultimately envisioned. Um, I will note for council, the, the matter that is before them today does have to do with the development permit in line with the development permit area guidelines. The zone that permits for these uses is already established and already does permit these uses, which would be all they would require is a business license to actually undertake the use. And the matter is before council today really has to do with the, the forming character of the building itself. So just some general comments. It, it's an innovative uh, kind of approach uh, of having this sort of mixed where you can live upstairs and then do all this other things. 
and I, I think it's a good location for that. We also have that on the other other side of the river, uh, some uh, the ability for that. So it's a it's an interesting uh, concept, and I think it's it's a good place to allow that kind of mixed use. I think it's a a little unusual and wouldn't work in many places um, because it's in an industrial area. People are, I mean, it's pretty obvious for anybody that's going there to for accommodation. That it's pretty obvious what's happening. Really, it's pretty obvious. Uh, a question, another question to the mayor. Uh, on phase one and phase two, it seems to me that there was restrictive use that the residential was, other than caretaker and that stuff, wasn't allowed. Or is that permitted now in phase one, phase two? Through your worship to Councilor Palmer, again, I want to um, really make sure that we're focusing on the, the building that's before Council today. But just as some background and as some history, the site was originally zoned M1 when buildings one and two were originally proposed, which is light industrial. And then the applicant had retroactively gone and rezoned the entire property for all phases one through four to this comprehensive development zone that does now permit all the multitude of uses as per CD16. So all four buildings are permitted to have those uses. Right. And so to the mayor, that, that to me, that's an important component because phase one and phase two didn't allow that but now that it looks like that's been changed and so it's consistent with the area so i'm very supportive of this application great any other comments or questions all those in favor opposed motions carried unanimously thank you mr simon appreciate that moving on to 11d uh community economic development green belt and trail network funding uh, Ms. Braun, do you have uh, any comments or presentations or Mr. Black to your this? Uh, through your worship, I believe uh, Darren Kamenowski is going to speak to this project. Great. Mr. Kamenowski. Yeah, your worship, at this point, um, I, I don't have any comments uh, unless there's some questions. All right. Uh, someone want to put this on the table for me, please. Councillor Brookshill. Did the General Assembly contract be amended to include funding for the Resort Municipality Initiative as approved by Council for Trails in June 2020? Second for the motion, Councillor Sherlett. Any further discussion on this? This is just giving you a little more funding for doing this project. Is that correct, Mr. Kamenowski? Yes, sir, Your Worship, that's correct. All right. Well, I'm supportive of that. Let me tell you. All those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Elliott? No, Councillor Elliott is opposed. Thank you. All right, moving on to correspondence. We have a letter from Mr. Malpe dated June 29th. He is concerned over perpetual care memorial benches. I'm going to ask that somebody put the motion on. I'm going to speak to this because I was actually in, in uh, brought this project to life 10 years ago. So, Councillor Sherlock. In response, we written to Mr. Malby agreeing to, to extend the lifespan of the perpetual care bench. Second for the motion, please. Councilor Brooks Hill. So I'd like to speak to this uh, back probably in, uh, oh, I'm going to say the 90s. Uh, we had a proposal to start a bench program in the community, it's free benches for the community. Uh, we started in the cemetery where we had a local resident who actually purchased two benches. And then I purchased two benches and we started the program. And now we have benches all over the community. And uh, as, uh, as of course, as, as Mr. Malpe has stated, uh, there was a change in the policy uh, partway through. I'm uh, going to be talking to staff about this uh, regarding the perpetual care and how we switch over and that sort of thing. I'm supportive of this letter going to Mr. Malpe to extend the lifespan of, of his particular bench, and then we're going to talk about the community benches as well and kind of move through. So I just ask for you to support this. I think it's a good thing, but I want this to be staff driven as to how we deal with this. We're doing all kinds of care, and now we're switching over to a composite project versus a wood project product so that we don't have to store them all and so that we can leave them out during the year. So there's a, a great way of moving this forward. Council works up. <clears throat> I, I I fully support this. I just had more questions of like, well, if, you know, uh, how long are we increasing the lifespan for? What are we doing for the other people who purchased them? But I, I'm happy if it's going to come back to council once 
So it, may, it may come back to council or it may just be a policy change generally uh, within, the, within the program stating that we're going to do this right now it's 20 years. Um, so as we look at uh, purchasing these and moving forward into the composite project or product, um, there's not necessarily any refurbishing to do unless they get damaged somehow. And so when we look at that, we may be able to either extend that uh, moving forward for what they're paying, but also we want to make sure that what people are paying is what it's costing the city so that the taxpayer is not subsidizing. So it's going to be a, a conversation and, and move that forward. If it needs to come back to council for ratification, it will, but we'll see what staff say as we move forward. All right, all those in favor? Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to a letter from from District of Sycamus uh, provided to support the protection of outdoor recreation opportunities. Um, any any comment on that? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Mr. Thank Palmer. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I was actually asking for a letter to be provided in support of the protection of outdoor. Do you want to just receive it or give a letter of support? Just a motion to receive. Okay, is there a second for that motion? Councilor Sherlock, any discussion on that? Yeah, so is Councilor that an amendment to the, or is there no motion? We haven't put a motion, we just put a motion on now to I would, just receive. I would like to make a motion to uh, write the letter. Okay. So I'm not going to be voting in favor of that. Well, you're going to be in favor of it and still do another motion. Pardon me? You can still receive it. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, sure. Okay. Any further discussion on receiving the letter? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Do you want to put a new motion? Yeah, I put on a motion to write the letter in support. Okay. Is there a second for that motion? So, Councilor Sherlock, any further discussion on that? Councilor Sherlock? Uh, I. I'm curious to hear what Councillor Palmer has to say about this one. I was reading through and had reservations at first, but having been part of some of our community conversations about that balance between tourism, power, gas powered tourism versus people powered tourism versus forestry versus the environment, there are a lot of needs to balance and perspectives to balance as we develop these policies. And as the government's do their work to try and protect the caribou and to find that balance and protect our environment, I think it's important they do have all the stakeholders at the table. The snowmobilers are a big stakeholder for this. So uh, I am in support of the letter being written. Great. So uh, having sat at this table with, uh, with the District of Sycamus and our local uh, snowmobile club and the BC Snowmobile Club, uh, they definitely, their whole idea is making sure that we can still have recreation without disturbing the caribou and the backcountry and working together as a unit to do it, which is the appropriate way to do it rather than going to air straight back and just soon build where you want. So I think this is a, a good project. Any other council, Councilor Palmer? Yeah, just in reply to Councilor Sure that it, the other reason for my motion to receive was because there's there's more consequences behind that. So I would prefer just to have left it at that um, without knowing all the implications. In because the last thing I want to do is start hitting different use backcountry use issues uh, it, it, users against each other. And one of the big things that we're lacking right now is that the backcountry. Um, a, a master plan for backcountry use, and that in the, I think a lot of this stuff really should be in that in that context rather than sort of one-offs. Um, at the same time, snowmobiling is a very important economic driver, one part of our tourism uh, aspect, and uh, the uh, uh, for the district of Sycamus, that's become a very important. Uh, economic driver in their tourism stuff because before they were basically a summer or two month, two or three month uh, uh, tourism entity. And now with Sycamose, is, this is, the snowmobiling is becoming much, uh, much bigger and important thing to uh, broaden their, uh, their, their uh, tourism stuff. So that's, that's important, but yeah, so there's, um, I'll probably support this, uh, but there's, 
be nice to see us looking at the bigger comprehensive plan of what we're doing with uh, backcountry use. And that's a big thing that needs to be addressed. Any other comments? <coughs> I wasn't I wasn't sure if I would support it or not, but the thing that irritated me the most is that if the snowmobile clubs are grooming these roads as trails, and the forestry won't even let them know that they're planning on plowing it. That is just like, you know, because they know in advance, but they're just not even telling them. But it's like, that is just so irritating to me. Like, that they're not even communicating. Yeah. That, yeah. Good. Sorry. Uh, any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor of writing a letter? Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Uh, Revelstoke Community Housing Society request for letter of support uh, for their action plan update. Uh, someone will put that motion on the table. Council Brooks Hill. That a letter be provided to the Revelstoke Community Housing Society in support of their proposed microphone. Second for the motion. Councilor Sherlock. Discussion on the motion. I think this is a positive. We're basically saying in the uh, we're supportive of this. We're not uh, giving them the land, but we're supportive of this sort of initiative moving forward. So I think that's a good thing. Any further comment? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Moving on to part number two, uh, that the Housing Society be provided with an update. Someone want to put that motion on there. Council Brooks, so. That the Revelso Community Housing Society be provided with an update on the status of the housing action plan project. Second for the motion, Councilor Sherlet. Any discussion on that motion, Councilor Palmer? Yes. Sir. What What does that mean? Like, who Who is going to provide the update on the housing action plan? And what is uh, Ms. Wade, are you present? Do you want to weigh in that, please? Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, um, I've been in contact with uh, the Housing Society, and um, uh, we're going to. There's a meeting coming up, and we're going to discuss where the Housing Action Plan is at, along with a number of other topics. Uh, the Housing Action Plan falls within this department, and we're going to work collaboratively as we unfold the engagement plan, as Councillor Schlatt had indicated earlier. Um, so, this will be an ongoing process uh, with. The society is being one of the stakeholders, along with the community at large and others. Great. Does that answer your question, Council? Um, I'm probably missing a piece of information. I'm not sure if it's been before my time, but I, I, I'm almost feeling that I, the Council needs a, an update, be provided an update on the Housing Action Plan, but maybe I'm missing a piece. Ms. Wade, uh, something will be coming to Council regarding that Housing Action Plan as well, correct? That's correct, Your Worship. It'll be coming forward. Um, we've had previous discussions, just an updates on Community of the Whole, where we're at. Um, and we have uh, Urban Matters working with us on the housing inventory right now that will actually define our how specify housing type, need income type, so that we can inform uh, what we need from a gap analysis. And it also dovetails over the OCP as well. Any further comments or questions, Council? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Moving on to communications, community economic development, uh, the commission meeting uh, minutes, I was present for that. Any questions or concerns? Seeing none, moving on to uh, social development committee meeting minutes for July 23rd, Council Ryan was present. Did, uh, going back to the uh, economic committee, did they get any recommendations that we need to here or you implement from the council, or was there any directive from that committee? Not at this point. I think in general, that's what I, I, I would hope our committee start start to do is start providing some some recommendations from some actual actual action points that we can move on. Yeah, and, and I think that's something we should encourage. Ron, they're talking about that, so yeah, absolutely. Okay, going back to social development. Any uh, any comments or questions? Seeing none. Any questions from the press, Ms. Floyd or Ms. Rousseau? Uh, through your worship, no, we don't have any inquiries from the press. All right, then I'm going to move forward to asking to go in camera pursuant to Section 90.1A of the Community Charter, moved by Councillor Shillette, seconded by Councillor Elliott. All in favor, motions carried.